This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Damsel in Distress by P. G. Woodhouse. Read by Yas Pistachio in Waxaw, North Carolina. Chapter 15 Lord Belfer's twenty first birthday dawned brightly heralded in by much twittering of sparrows in the ivy outside his bedroom. These Percy did not hear, for he was sound asleep, and had had a late night. The first sound that was able to penetrate his heavy slumber, and rouse him to a realization that his birthday had arrived, was the piercing cry of Reggie Bing on his way to the bathroom across the corridor. It was Reggie's disturbing custom to urge himself on to a cold bath with encouraging yells, and the noise of this performance, followed by a violent splashing and a series of sharp howls, as the sponge played upon the Bing spine, made sleep an impossibility within a radius of many yards. Percy sat up in bed and cursed Reggie silently. He discovered that he had a headache. Presently the door flew open, and the vocalist entered in person, clad in a pink bathrobe and very tousled and rosy from the tub. "'Many happy returns of the day, boots, old thing!' Reggie burst rollickingly into song. "'I'm twenty-one to-day, twenty-one to-day. I've got the key of the door, never been twenty-one before, and father says I can do what I like, so shout hip-hip hooray! I'm a jolly good fellow, twenty-one to-day!' Lord Belfer scowled morosely. "'I wish you wouldn't make that infernal noise!' "'What infernal noise?' "'That singing!' "'My God!' "'God, this man has wounded me,' said Reggie. "'I've a headache.' "'I thought you would have, laddie, when I saw you getting away with the liquid last night. An X-ray photograph of your liver would show something that looked like a crumpled oak leaf, studded with hobnails. You ought to take more exercise, dear heart. Except for sloshing that policeman, you haven't done anything athletic for years. "'I wish you wouldn't harp on that affair.' Reggie sat down on the bed. "'Between ourselves, old man,' he said confidentially, "'I also, I myself, Reginald Bing, in person, "'was perhaps a shade polluted during the evening. "'I give you my honest word that just after dinner "'I saw three versions of your uncle, the bishop, "'standing in a row side by side. "'I tell you, laddie, that for a moment "'I thought I had strayed into a bishop's beano at Exeter Hall, "'or the Athenium, or wherever it is "'those chappies collect in gangs.' Then the three bishops sort of congealed into one bishop, a trifle blurred about the outlines, and I felt relieved. But what convinced me that I had emptied a flagon or so too many was a rather rummy thing that occurred later on. Have you ever happened, during one of these feasts of reason and flows of soul, when you were bubbling over with joie de vivre, have you ever happened to see things? What I mean to say is, I had a deuced odd experience last night." I could have sworn that one of the waiter chappies was that fellow who knocked off your hat in Piccadilly. Lord Belfer, who had sunk back onto the pillows at Reggie's entrance, and had been listening to his talk with only intermittent attention, shot up in bed. What? Absolutely. My mistake, of course, but there it was. The fellow might have been his double. But you've never seen the man. Oh, yes, I have. I forgot to tell you. I met him on the links yesterday. I'd gone out there alone, rather expecting to have a round with a pro, but, finding this lad there, I suggested that we might go round together. We did eighteen holes, and he licked the boots off me. Very hot stuff he was, and after the game he took me off to his cottage and gave me a drink. He lives at the cottage next door to Platt's farm, so, you see, it was the identical chappy. We got extremely matey, like brothers. Absolutely. So— you can understand what a shock it gave me when I found what I took to be the same man serving bracers to the multitude for the same evening. One of those nasty jars that causes a fellow's head to swim a bit, don't you know, and make him lose confidence in himself. Lord Belfer did not reply. His brain was whirling. So he had been right, after all. You know, pursued Reggie seriously, "'I think you are making the bloomer of a lifetime over this hat-swatting chappy. "'You've misjudged him. He's a first-rate sort. "'Take it from me. Nobody could have got out of the bunker at the fifteenth hole better than he did. 
If you'll take my advice, you'll conciliate the feller. A really first-class golfer is what you need in the family. Besides, even leaving out of the question the fact that he can do things with a niblick that I didn't think anybody except the pro could do, he's a corking good sort, a stout fellow in every respect. I took to the chappy. He's all right. Grab him boots before he gets away. That's my tip to you. He'll never regret it. From first to last, this lad didn't foozle a single drive, and his approach putting has to be seen to be believed. Well, well, got to dress, I suppose. Mustn't waste life springtime sitting here talking to you. Doodle-oo, laddie, we shall meet anon. Lord Belfer leaped from his bed. He was feeling worse than ever now, and a glance into the mirror told him that he looked rather worse than he felt. Late nights and insufficient sleep, added to the need of a shave, always made him look like something that should have been swept up and taken away to the ash-bin. And as for his physical condition, talking to Reggie Bing never tended to make you feel better when you had a headache. Reggie's manner was not soothing, and on this particular morning his choice of topic had been unusually irritating. Lord Belfer told himself that he could not understand Reggie. He had never been able to make his mind quite clear as to the exact relations between the latter and his sister Maud but he had always been under the impression that, if they were not actually engaged, they were on the verge of becoming so, and it was maddening to have to listen to Reggie advocating the claims of a rival, as if he had no personal interest in the affair at all. Percy felt for his complacent friend something of the annoyance which a householder feels for the watchdog whom he finds fraternizing with the burglar. Why, Reggie, more than any one else, ought to be foaming with rage at the insolence of this American fellow in coming down to Belfer and planting himself at the castle gates. Instead of which, on his own showing, he appeared to have adopted an attitude towards him which would have excited remark if adopted by David towards Jonathan. He seemed to spend all his spare time frolicking with the man on the golf links and hobnobbing with him in his house. Lord Belfer was thoroughly upset. It was impossible to prove it, or to do anything about it now, but he was convinced that the fellow had wormed his way into the castle in the guise of a waiter. He had probably met Maud, and plotted further meetings with her. This thing was becoming unendurable. One thing was certain. The family honour was in his hands. Anything that was to be done to keep Maud away from the intruder must be done by himself. Reggie was hopeless. He was capable, as far as Percy could see, of escorting Maud to the fellow's door in his own car, and leaving her on the threshold with his blessing. As for Lord Marshmorton, Roses and the family history took up so much of his time that he could not be counted on for anything but moral support. He, Percy, must do the active work. He had just come to this decision, when, approaching the window and gazing down into the grounds, he perceived his sister Maud walking rapidly, and, so it seemed to him, with a furtive air, down the east drive. And it was to the east that Platt's farm, and the cottage next door to it, lay. At the moment of this discovery, Percy was in a costume ill adapted for the taking of a country walk. Reggie's remarks about his liver had struck home, and it had been his intention, by way of a corrective to his headache and a general feeling of swollen ill-health, to do a little work before his bath with a pair of Indian clubs. He had arrayed himself for this purpose in an old sweater, a pair of grey flannel trousers, and patent leather evening shoes. It was not the garb he would have chosen himself for a ramble, but time was flying, even to put on a pair of boots is a matter of minutes, and in another moment or two Maud would be out of sight. Percy ran downstairs, snatched up a soft shooting hat, which proved, too late, to belong to a person with a head two sizes smaller than his own, and raced out into the grounds. He was just in time to see Maud disappearing round the corner of the drive. Lord Belfer had never belonged to that virile class of the community which considers running a pleasure and a pastime. At Oxford, on those occasions when the members of his college had turned out on raw afternoons to trot along the river bank, encouraging the college eight with yelling and the swinging of police rattles, Percy had always stayed prudently in his rooms with tea and buttered toast, thereby avoiding who knows what colds and coughs. When he ran, 
he ran reluctantly, and with a definite object in view, such as the catching of a train. He was consequently not in the best of condition, and the sharp sprint, which was imperative at this juncture if he was to keep his sister in view, left him spent and panting. But he had the reward of reaching the gate of the drive not many seconds after Maud, and of seeing her walking, more slowly now, down the road that led to Platt's. This confirmation of his suspicions enabled him momentarily to forget the blister which was forming on the heel of his left foot. He set out after her at a good pace. The road, after the habit of country roads, wound and twisted. The quarry was frequently out of sight, and Percy's anxiety was such that every time Maud vanished he broke into a gallop. Another hundred yards, and the blister no longer consented to be ignored. It cried for attention like a little child, and was rapidly insinuating itself into a position of the scheme of things, where it threatened to become the centre of the world. By the time the third bend in the road was reached, it seemed to Percy that this blister had become the one great fact in an unreal nightmare-like universe. He hobbled painfully, and when he stopped suddenly and darted back into the shelter of the hedge, his foot seemed aflame. The only reason why the blister on his left heel did not at this juncture attract his entire attention was that he had become aware that there was another of equal proportions forming on his right heel. Percy had stopped and sought cover in the hedge because, as he rounded the bend in the road, he perceived, before he had time to check his gallop, that Maud had also stopped. She was standing in the middle of the road, looking over her shoulder, not ten yards away. Had she seen him? It was a point that time alone could solve. No. She walked on again. She had not seen him. Lord Belpher, by means of a notable triumph of mind over matter, forgot the blisters and hurried after her. They had now reached that point in the road where three choices offer themselves to the wayfarer. By going straight on he might win through to the village of Moresby in the Vale, a charming little place with a Norman church. By turning to the left he might visit the equally seductive hamlet of Little Weeting. By turning to the right, off the main road and going down a leafy lane, he may find himself at the door of Platt's farm. When Maud, reaching the crossroads, suddenly swung down the one to the left, Lord Belpher was for the moment completely baffled. Reason reasserted its way the next minute, telling him that this was but a ruse. Whether or no she had caught sight of him, there was no doubt that Maud intended to shake off any possible pursuit by taking this speciously innocent turning and making a detour. She could have no possible motive in going to Little Weeting. He had never been to Little Weeting in his life, and there was no reason to suppose that Maud had either. The signpost informed him— a statement strenuously denied by the twin blisters, that the distance to Little Weeting was one and a half miles. Lord Belpher's view of it was that it was nearer fifty. He dragged himself along wearily. It was simpler now to keep Maud in sight, for the road ran straight. But, there being a catch in everything in this world, the process was also messier. In order to avoid being seen, it was necessary for Percy to leave the road, and— tramp along in the deep ditch, which ran parallel to it. There is nothing half-hearted about these ditches which accompany English country roads. They know they are intended to be ditches, not mere furrows, and they behave as such. The one that sheltered Lord Belpher was so deep that only his head and neck protruded above the level of the road, and so dirty that a bare twenty yards of travel was sufficient to coat him with mud. Rain, once fallen, is reluctant to leave the English ditch. It nestles inside it for weeks, forming a rich oatmeal-like substance, which has to be stirred to be believed. Percy stirred it. He churned it. He ploughed and sloshed through it. The mud stuck to him like a brother. Nevertheless, being a determined young man, he did not give in. Once he lost a shoe, but a little searching recovered that. On another occasion, a passing dog— Seeing things going on in the ditch, which, in his opinion, should not have been going on, he was a high-strung dog, unused to coming upon heads, moving along the road without bodies attached, accompanied Percy for over a quarter of a mile, 
causing him exquisite discomfort by making sudden runs at his face. A well-aimed stone settled this little misunderstanding, and Percy proceeded on his journey alone. He had Maud well in view when, to his surprise, she left the road and turned into the gate of a house which stood not far from the church. Lord Belpher regained the road and remained there, a puzzled man. A dreadful thought came to him that he might have had all this trouble and anguish for no reason. This house bore the unmistakable stamp of a vicarage. Maud could have no reason that was not innocent for going there. Had he gone through all this merely to see his sister paying a visit to a clergyman? Too late it occurred to him that she might quite easily be on visiting terms with the clergy of Little Weeting. He had forgotten that he had been away at Oxford for many weeks, a period of time in which Maud, finding life in the country weigh upon her, might easily have interested herself, charitably, in the life of this village. He paused irresolutely. He was baffled. Maud, meanwhile, had rung the bell. Ever since looking over her shoulder, she had perceived her brother Percy dodging about in the background. Her active young mind had been busying itself with schemes for throwing him off the trail. She must see George that morning. She could not wait another day before establishing communication between herself and Geoffrey. But it was not till she reached Little Weeting that there occurred to her any plan that promised success. A trim maid opened the door. "'Is the vicar in?' "'No, miss. He went out half an hour back.' Maud was as baffled for the moment as her brother Percy, now leaning against the vicarage wall in a state of advanced exhaustion. "'Oh, dear,' she said. The maid was sympathetic. "'Mr. Ferguson, the curate, ma'am, he's here, if he would do.' Maud brightened. "'He would do splendidly. Will you ask him if I can see him for a moment?' "'Very well, miss. What name, please?' "'He won't know my name. Will you please tell him that a lady wishes to see him?' "'Yes, miss. Won't you step in?' The front door closed behind Maud. She followed the maid into the drawing-room. Presently a young small curate entered. He had a willing, benevolent face. He looked alert and helpful. "'You wish to see me?' "'I am so sorry to trouble you,' said Maud, rocking the young man in his tracks with a smile of dazzling brilliancy. "'No trouble, I assure you,' said the curate dizzily. "'But there is a man following me.' The curate clicked his tongue indignantly. "'A rough sort of tramp kind of man. He has been following me for miles, and I am frightened.' "'Brute! I think he is outside now. I can't think what he wants. Would you—' "'Would you mind being kind enough to go and send him away?' The eyes that had settled George's fate for all eternity flashed upon the curate, who blinked. He squared his shoulders and drew himself up. He was perfectly willing to die for her. "'If you will wait here,' he said, "'I will go and send him about his business. It is disgraceful that the public highways should be rendered unsafe in this manner.' "'Thank you ever so much,' said Maud gratefully. I can't help thinking the poor fellow might be a little crazy. It seems so odd of him to follow me all that way. Walking in the ditch, too. Walking in the ditch? Yes. He walked most of the way in the ditch, at the side of the road. He seemed to prefer it. I can't think why. Lord Belpher, leaning against the wall and trying to decide whether his right or left foot hurt him the more excruciatingly, became aware that a curate— was standing before him, regarding him through a pair of gold-rimmed pince-nez, with a disapproving and hostile expression. Lord Belpher returned his gaze. Neither was favourably impressed by the other. Percy thought he had seen nicer-looking curates, and the curate thought he had seen more prepossessing tramps. "'Come, come,' said the curate. "'This won't do, my man.' A few hours earlier Lord Belpher had been startled when addressed by George as Sir, to be called My Man, took his breath away completely. The gift of seeing ourselves as others see us is, as the poet indicates, vouchsafed to few men. Lord Belpher, not being one of those fortunates, had not the slightest conception how intensely revolting his personal appearance was at that moment. The red-rimmed eyes, 
the growth of stubble on the cheeks, and the thick coating of mud which had resulted from his rambles in the ditch combined to render him a horrifying object. "'How dare you follow that young lady? I've a good mind to give you in charge.' Percy was outraged. "'I'm her brother!' He was about to substantiate the statement by giving his name, but stopped himself. He had had enough of letting his name out, on occasions like the present. When the policeman had arrested him in the haymarket, his first act had been to thunder his identity at the man, and the policeman, without saying in so many words that he disbelieved him, had hinted scepticism by replying that he himself was the King of Brixton. "'I'm her brother,' he repeated thickly. The curate's disapproval deepened. In a sense, we are all brothers, but that did not prevent him from considering that this mud-stained derelict had made an impudent and abominable misstatement of fact. Not unnaturally, he came to the conclusion that he had to do with a victim of the demon rum. "'You ought to be ashamed of yourself,' he said severely. "'Sad piece of human wreckage as you are. You speak like an educated man. Have you no self-respect? Do you never search your heart and shudder at the horrible degradation which you have brought on yourself by sheer weakness of will? He raised his voice. The subject of temperance was one very near to the curate's heart. The vicar himself had complimented him only yesterday on the good his sermons against the drink evil were doing in the village, and the landlord of the three pigeons down the road had on several occasions spoken bitter things about blighters who came taking the living away from honest folks. "'It is easy enough to stop if you will but use a little resolution. "'You say yourself, just one won't hurt me. "'Perhaps not. "'But can you be content with just one? "'Ah, no, my man, there is no middle way for such as you. "'It must be all or nothing. "'Stop it now, now while you still can retain some semblance of humanity. "'Soon it will be too late. "'Kill that craving, stifle it, strangle it, make up your mind now.' now that not another drop of this accursed stuff shall pass your lips the curate paused he perceived that enthusiasm was leading him away from the main issue a little perseverance he concluded rapidly and you will soon find that cocoa gives you exactly the same pleasure and now will you please be getting along you have frightened the young lady and she cannot continue her walk unless i assure her that you have gone away fatigue pain, and the annoyance of having to listen to this man's well-meant but ill-judged utterances, had combined to induce in Percy a condition bordering on hysteria. He stamped his foot, and uttered a howl, as the blisters warned him with a sharp twinge that this sort of behaviour could not be permitted. "'Stop talking!' he bellowed. "'Stop talking like an idiot! I'm going to stay here till that girl comes out, if I have to wait all day!' The curate regarded Percy thoughtfully. Percy was no Hercules, but then neither was the curate. And in any case, though no Hercules, Percy was undeniably an ugly-looking brute. Strategy, rather than force, seemed to the curate to be indicated. He paused a while, as one who weighs pros and cons, then spoke briskly with an air of the man who has decided to yield a point with good grace. "'Dear, dear,' he said. "'That won't do. "'You say you are this young lady's brother?' "'Yes, I do.' "'Then perhaps you had better come with me into the house, "'and we will speak to her.' "'All right. "'Follow me.' "'Percy followed him. "'Down the trim gravel walk they passed, "'and up the neat stone steps. "'Maud, peeping through the curtains, "'thought herself the victim of a monstrous betrayal "'of equally monstrous blunder.' but she did not know the Reverend Cyril Ferguson. No general adroitly leading the army on by strategic retreat ever had a situation more thoroughly in hand. Passing with his companion through the open door, he crossed the hall to another door, discreetly closed. "'Wait in here,' he said. Lord Belfer moved unsuspectingly forward. A hand pressed sharply against the small of his back, Behind him a door slammed, and a key clicked. He was trapped. Groping in Egyptian darkness, his hands met a coat, then a hat, then an umbrella, 
Then he stumbled over a golf club and fell against a wall. It was too dark to see anything, but his sense of touch told him all he needed to know. He had been added to the vicar's collection of odds and ends in the closet reserved for that purpose. He groped his way to the door and kicked it. He did not repeat the performance. His feet were in no shape for kicking things. Percy's gallant soul abandoned the struggle. With a feeble oath, he sat down on a box containing croquet implements, and gave himself up to thought. "'You'll be quite safe now,' the curate was saying in the adjoining room, not without a touch of complacent self-approval, such as becomes the vicar in a battle of wits. "'I have locked him in the cupboard. He will be quite happy there.' An incorrect statement, this. "'You may now continue your walk in perfect safety.' "'Thank you ever so much,' said Maud. "'But I do hope he won't be violent when you let him out.' "'I shall not let him out,' replied the curate, who, though brave, was not rash. "'I shall depute the task to a worthy fellow named Willis, in whom I shall have every confidence. He—he he is, in fact, our local blacksmith.' And so it came about that, when, after a vigil that seemed to last for a lifetime, Percy heard the key turn in the lock, and burst forth seeking whom he may devour, he experienced an almost instant quieting of his excited nervous system. Confronting him was a vast man whose muscles, like those of that other and more celebrated village blacksmith, were plainly as strong as iron bands. The man eyed Percy with a chilly eye. "'Well,' he said, "'what's troublin' you?' Percy gulped. The man's mere appearance was a sedative. "'Er, uh, nothing,' he replied. "'Nothing.' "'There better hadn't be,' said the man darkly. "'Mr. Ferguson gave me this to give to you. Take it.' Percy took it. It was a shilling. "'And this.' The second gift was a small paper pamphlet. It was entitled, Now's the Time, and seemed to be a story of some kind. At any rate, Percy's eyes, before they began to swim in a manner that prevented steady reading, caught the words, Joe Roberts had always been a hard-drinking man. But one day, as he was coming out of the bar-parlour, he was about to hurl it from him when he met the other's eye, and desisted. Rarely had Lord Belfer encountered a man with a more speaking eye— and now you get along, said the man. You pop off, and I'm going to watch you do it, too. And if I find you sneaking off to the three pigeons— His pause was more eloquent than his speech, and nearly as eloquent as his eye. Lord Belfer tucked the tract into his sweater, pocketed the shilling, and left the house. For nearly a mile down the well-remembered highway he was aware of a presence in his rear— but he continued on his way without a glance behind. Like one that on a lonely road doth walk in fear and dread, and, having once looked back, walks on, and turns no more his head, because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. Maud made her way across the fields to the cottage down by Platts. Her heart was as light as the breeze that ruffled the green hedges, Gaily she tripped towards the cottage door. Her hand was just raised to knock, when from within came the sound of a well-known voice. She had reached her goal, but her father had anticipated her. Lord Marshmorton had selected the same moment as herself for paying a call upon George Bevan. Maud tiptoed away and hurried back to the castle. Never before had she so clearly realized what a handicap— an adhesive family can be to a young girl. End of chapter 15by Madame Tusk, www.rlowalrus.siteslead.com Chapter 16 At the moment of Lord Marshmorton's arrival, George was reading a letter from Billy Dore, 
which had come by that morning's post. It dealt mainly with the vicissitudes experienced by Miss Dore's friend, Miss Sinclair, in her relations with the man Spencer Gray. Spencer Gray, it seemed, had been behaving oddly. Ardent towards Miss Clare, almost to an embarrassing point in the early stages of their acquaintance, he had suddenly cooled, at a recent lunch had behaved with a strange aloofness, and now, at this writing, had vanished altogether, leaving nothing behind him but an abrupt note to the effect that he had been compelled to go abroad, and that, much as it was to be regretted, he and she would probably never meet again. "'And if,' wrote Miss Dore, justifiably annoyed, "'after saying all those things to the poor kid, and telling her she was the only thing in sight, he thinks he can just slide off with a good-bye, good luck, and God bless you, he's got another guest coming. And that's not all. He hasn't gone abroad. I saw him in Piccadilly this afternoon. He saw me, too. And what do you think he did? Duck down a side street, if you please. He must have run like a rabbit at that, because when I got there he was nowhere to be seen. I tell you, George, there's something funny about all this.' Having been made once or twice before the confidant of the tempestuous romances of Billy's friends, which always seemed to go wrong somewhere in the middle and to die a natural death before arriving at any definite point, George was not particularly interested, except in so far as the letter afforded rather comforting evidence that he was not the only person in the world who was having trouble of the kind. He skimmed through the rest of it, and had just finished when there was a sharp rap at the front door. "'Come in,' called George. There entered a sturdy little man, of middle age, whom, at first sight, George could not place, and yet he had the impression that he had seen him before. Then he recognized him as the gardener to whom he had given the note for Maud that day at the castle. The alteration in the man's costume was what had momentarily baffled George. When they had met in the rose garden, the other had been arrayed in untidy gardening clothes. Now, presumably in his Sunday suit, it was amusing to observe how almost dapper he had become. Really, you might have passed him in the lane and taken him for some neighbouring squire. George's heart raced. Your lover is ever optimistic, and he could conceive of no errand that could have brought this man to his cottage, unless he were charged with the delivery of a note from Maud. He spared a moment from his happiness to congratulate himself on having picked such an admirable go-between. Here, evidently, was one of those trusty old retainers you read about, faithful, willing, discreet, ready to do anything for the little missy, bless her heart. Probably he had danced Maud on his knee in her infancy, and with a dog-like affection had watched her at her childish sports. George beamed at this honest fellow, and felt in his pocket to make sure that a suitable tip lay safely therein. "'Good morning,' he said. "'Good morning,' replied the man. A purist might have said he spoke gruffly and without geniality, but that is the beauty of these old retainers. They make a point of deliberately trying to deceive strangers as to the goldenness of their hearts by adopting a forbidding manner, and good morning, not good morning, sir. Sturdy independence, you observe, as befits a free man. George closed the door carefully. He glanced into the kitchen. Mrs. Platt was not there. All was well. You've brought a note from Lady Maud? The honest fellow's rather dour expression seemed to grow a shade bleaker. "'If you are alluding to Lady Maud Marsh, my daughter,' he replied frostily, "'I have not.' For the past few days George had been no stranger to shocks, and had indeed come almost to regard them as part of the normal everyday life, but this latest one had a stumbling effect. "'I beg your pardon?' he said. "'So you ought to,' replied the Earl. George swallowed once or twice to relieve a curious dryness of the mouth. "'Are you Lord Marshmoreton?' "'I am.' "'Good Lord! You seem surprised.' "'It's nothing,' muttered George. "'At least you—I mean to say, it's only that there's a curious resemblance between you and one of your gardeners at the castle. I, I dare say you've noticed it yourself. My hobby is gardening.' Light broke upon George. "'Then was it really you it was?' George sat down. "'This opens up a whole new line of thought.' he said. Lord Marshmoreton remained standing. He shook his head sternly. "'It won't do, Mr. I have never heard your name.' "'Bevan,' replied George, rather relieved at being able to remember it in the midst of his mental turmoil. "'It won't do, Mr. Bevan. It must stop. I allude to this absurd entanglement between yourself and my daughter. It must stop at once.' It seemed to George that such an entanglement could hardly be said to have begun, but he did not say so. Lord Marshmoreton resumed his remarks. 
Lady Caroline had sent him to the cottage to be stern, and his firm resolve to be stern lent his style of speech something of the measured solemnity and careful phrasing of his occasional orations in the House of Lords. "'I have no wish to be unduly hard upon the indiscretions of youth. Youth is the period of romance, when the heart rules the head. I, myself, was once a young man.' "'Well, you're practically that now,' said George. "'Eh?' cried Lord Marshmoreton, forgetting the thread of his discourse in the shock of pleased surprise. "'You don't look a day over forty. "'Oh, come, come, my boy. Uh, "'I mean, Mr. Bevan. "'You don't, honestly. "'I'm forty-eight. "'In the prime of life. "'And you don't think I look it. "'You certainly don't. "'Well, well, well. "'By the way, have you tobacco, my boy? "'I came without my pouch. "'Just at your elbow. "'Pretty good stuff. "'I bought it in the village.' "'The same I smoke myself. "'Quite a coincidence. "'Distinctly. "'Match? "'Thank you. "'I have one.' "'George filled his own pipe. "'The thing was becoming a love-feast. "'What was I saying?' "'said Lord Marshmoreton, "'blowing a comfortable cloud. "'Oh, yes.' "'He removed his pipe from his mouth "'with a touch of embarrassment. "'Yes, yes, to be sure.' "'There was an awkward silence. "'You must see for yourself,' "'said the Earl, "'how impossible it is.' "'George shook his head. I may be slow at grasping a thing, but I'm bound to say I can't see that. Lord Marshmoreton recalled some of the things his sister had told him to say. Uh, for one thing, for one thing, uh, what do we know of you? You are a perfect stranger. Well, we're all getting acquainted pretty quick, don't you think? I met your son in Piccadilly and had a long talk with him, and now you're paying me a neighborly visit. This was not intended to be a social call. But it has become one. And then, that is one point I wish to make, you know— "'Ours is an old family. "'I would like to remind you that there were Marshmoretons in Belpha before the War of the Roses. "'There were Bevans in Brooklyn before the BRT. "'I beg your pardon. "'I was only pointing out that I can trace my ancestry a long way. "'You have to trace things a long way in Brooklyn if you want to find them. "'I have never heard of Brooklyn. "'You've heard of New York? "'Certainly. "'New York's one of the outlying suburbs.' "'Lord Marshmoreton relit his pipe. "'He had a feeling that they were wandering from the point.' "'It is quite impossible. I can't see it. Maud is so young. Your daughter could be nothing else. Too young to know her own mind,' pursued Lord Marshmoreton, resolutely crushing down a flutter of pleasure. There was no doubt that this singularly agreeable man was making things very difficult for him. It was disarming to discover that he was really capital company, the best, indeed, that the Earl could remember to have discovered in the more recent period of his rather lonely life. At present, of course, she fancies that she is very much in love with you. It is absurd. You needn't tell me that, said George. Really, it was the only fact that people seemed to go out of their way to call at his cottage and tell him that Maud loved him that kept him from feeling his cause perfectly hopeless. It's incredible. It's a miracle. So you are a romantic young man, and you, no doubt, for the moment, suppose that you are in love with her. No. George was not going to allow a remark like that to pass unchallenged. You are wrong there. As far as I am concerned, there is no question of its being momentary or suppositious or anything of that kind. I am in love with your daughter. I was from the first moment I saw her. I always shall be. She is the only girl in the world. Stuff and nonsense. Not at all. Absolute cold fact. You have known her so little time. Long enough. Lord Marshmoreton sighed. You are upsetting things terribly. Things are upsetting me terribly. You were causing a great deal of trouble and annoyance. So did Romeo. Eh? I said, so did Romeo. I don't know anything about Romeo. As far as love is concerned, I begin where he left off. I wish I could persuade you to be sensible. That's just what I think I am. I wish I could get you to see my point of view. I do see your point of view. But dimly. You see, my own takes up such a lot of foreground. There was a pause. Then I am afraid, said Lord Marshmoreton, that we must leave matters as they stand, until they can be altered for the better. We will say no more about it now. Very well. But I must ask you to understand clearly that I shall have to do everything in my power to stop what I look on as an unfortunate entanglement. I understand. Very well. <clears throat> Lord Marshmoreton coughed. George looked at him with some surprise. He had supposed the interview to be at an end, but the other made no move to go. There seemed to be something on the Earl's mind. Uh, there is, uh, just one other thing, said Lord Marshmoreton. He coughed again. He felt embarrassed. <coughs> uh, just, just one other thing, he repeated. 
The reason for Lord Marshmoreton's visit to George had been twofold. In the first place, Lady Caroline had told him to go. That would have been reason enough. But what made the visit imperative was an unfortunate accident of which he had only that morning been made aware. It will be remembered that Billy Dore had told George that the gardener with whom she had become so friendly had taken her name and address with a view, later on, to send her some of his roses. The scrap of paper on which this information had been written was now lost. Lord Marshmoreton had been hunting for it since breakfast without avail. Billy Dore had made a decided impression upon Lord Marshmoreton. She belonged to a type which he had never before encountered, and it was one of which he had found more than agreeable. Her knowledge of roses, and the proper feeling which she manifested toward rose-growing as a life-work, consolidated the Earl's liking for her. Never in his memory had he come across so sensible and charming a girl, and he had looked forward with a singular intensity to meeting her again. And now some too zealous housemaid, tidying up after the irritating manner of her species, had destroyed the only clue to her identity. It was not for some time after this discovery that hope dawned again for Lord Marshmoreton. Only after he had given up the search for the missing paper as fruitless did he recall that it was in George's company that Billy had first come into his life. Between her, then, and himself, George was the only link. It was primarily for the purpose of getting Billy's name and address from George that he came to the cottage, and now that the moment had arrived for touching upon the subject, he felt a little embarrassed. "'When you visited the castle,' he said, "'when you visited the castle last Thursday,' said George helpfully, "'exactly. When you visited the castle last Thursday, there was a young lady with you.' Not realising that the subject had been changed, George was under the impression that the other had shifted his front and was about to attack him from another angle. He countered what seemed to him an insinuation stoutly. "'We merely had to meet at the castle. She came there quite independently of me.' Lord Marshmoreton looked alarmed. "'You didn't know her?' he said anxiously. "'Well, certainly I knew her. She's an old friend of mine. But if you are hinting—' "'Not at all,' rejoined the Earl, profoundly relieved. "'Not at all. I, I ask merely because this young lady, with whom I had some conversation, was good enough to give me her name and address. She, too, happened to mistake me for a gardener.' "'It's those corduroy trousers.' murmured George, in extenuation. "'I unfortunately have lost them.' "'You can always get another pair, eh?' "'I say, you can always get another pair of corduroy trousers.' "'I have not lost my trousers. I have lost the young lady's name and address.' "'Oh! I promised to send her some roses. She will be expecting them.' "'Well, that's odd. I was just reading a letter from her when you came in. That must be what she is referring to when she says, "'If you see Dada, the old dear, tell him not to forget my roses.' I read it three times and couldn't make any sense out of it. Are you Dada? The Earl smirked. She did address me in the course of our conversation as Dada. Then the message is for you. A very quaint, charming girl. But what is her name, and where can I find her? Her name's Billy Dor. Billy? 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 said Lord Marshmoreton softly. I had better write it down. And her address? I don't know her private address, but you could always reach her at the Regal Theatre. "'Ah, she's on the stage?' "'Yes, she's in my piece. Follow the girl.' "'Indeed. Are you a playwright, Mr. Bevan?' "'Oh, good Lord, no,' said George, shocked. "'I'm a composer.' "'Very interesting. "'And you met Miss Dore through her being in this play of yours?' "'Oh, no, I knew her before she went on the stage. "'She was a stenographer in a music publisher's office when we first met.' "'Good gracious! Was she really a stenographer?' "'Yes, why?' "'Oh, ah, uh, nothing, nothing.' Something just happened to come to my mind. What happened to come into Lord Marshmoreton's mind was a fleeting vision of Billy, installed in Miss Alice Faraday's place as his secretary. With such a helper it would be a pleasure to work on that infernal family history, which was now such a bitter toil. But the daydream passed. He knew perfectly well that he had not the courage to dismiss Alice. In the hands of that calm-eyed girl he was putty. She exercised over him the hypnotic spell a lion-tamer exercises over its little playmates. "'We have been pals for years,' said George. "'Billy is one of the best fellows in the world.' "'A charming girl. She would give her last nickel to anyone that asked for it. Delightful. Delightful. And as straight as a string. No one ever said a word against Billy. No. She may go out to lunch and supper and all that kind of thing, but there's nothing to that.' "'Nothing,' agreed the Earl warmly. "'Girls must eat.' "'They do. You ought to see them.' 
a little harmless relaxation after the fatigue of the day. Exactly, nothing more. Lord Marshmoreton felt more drawn than ever to this sensible young man. Sensible, at least, on all points but one. It was a pity they could not see eye to eye on what was and what was not suitable in the matter of love affairs of the aristocracy. "'So you are a composer, Mr. Bevan,' he said affably. "'Yes.' Lord Marshmoreton gave a little sigh. "'Tis a long time since I went up to see a musical performance. More than twenty years. When I was up at Oxford, and for some years afterwards, I was a great theatre-goer. Never used to miss a first night at the gaiety. Those were the days of Nellie Farron and Kate Vaughan. Florence St. John, too. How excellent she was, and fast up to date. But we missed Nellie Farron. Meyer Lutz was the gaiety composer then. But a good deal of water has flowed under the bridge since those days. I don't suppose you ever heard of Meyer Lutz? I don't think I have. Johnny Toole was playing a piece called Partners, not a good play, and the Yeoman of the Guard had just been produced at the Savoy. That makes it seem a long time ago, doesn't it? Well, I mustn't take up all your time. Good-bye, Mr. Bevan. I am glad to have had the opportunity of this little talk. The Regal Theatre, I think you said, is where your piece is playing. I shall probably be going to London shortly. I hope to see it. Lord Marshmoreton rose. As regards the other matter, there is no hope of inducing you to see the matter in the right light? We seem to disagree as to which is the right light. Then there is nothing more to be said. I will be perfectly frank with you, Mr. Bevan. I like you. The feeling is quite mutual. But I don't want you as a son-in-law, and— Damn it! exploded Lord Marshmoreton. I won't have you as a son-in-law. Good God! Do you think that you can harry and assault my son Percy in the heart of Piccadilly, and generally make yourself a damned nuisance, and then settle down here without an invitation at my very gates, and expect to be welcomed into the bosom of the family? If I were a young man— I thought we had agreed that you were a young man. Don't interrupt me! I only said— I heard what you said. Flattery! Nothing of the kind. Truth! Lord Marshmoreton melted. He smiled. Young idiot. Well, we agree there, all right. Lord Marshmoreton hesitated. Then, with a rush, he unbosomed himself and made his own position on the matter clear. I know what you'll be saying to yourself the moment my back is turned. You'll be calling me a stage heavy father and an old snob and a number of other things. Don't interrupt me, damn it. You will, I tell you. And you'll be wrong. I don't think the Marshmortons are fenced off from the rest of the world by some sort of divinity. My sister does. Percy does. But Percy's an ass. If ever you find yourself thinking differently from my son Percy on any subject, congratulate yourself. You'll be right. But I know what you're going to say. Let me finish. If I were the only person concerned, I wouldn't stand in Maud's way, whoever she wanted to marry, provided he was a good fellow and likely to make her happy. But I am not. There's my sister Caroline. There's a whole crowd of silly, cackling fools, my sisters, my sons-in-law, all the whole pack of them. If I didn't oppose Maud in this damned infatuation she's got for you, if I stood by and let her marry you, what do you think would happen to me? I'd never have a moment's peace. The whole gabbling pack of them would be at me, saying I was to blame. There would be arguments, discussions, family councils. I hate arguments. I loathe discussions. Family councils make me sick. I'm a peaceable man, and I like a quiet life and damn i'm going to have it so there's the thing for you in letters of one syllable i don't object to you personally but i'm not going to have you bothering me like this i'll admit freely that since i have made your acquaintance i have altered the unfavourable opinion i had formed of you from from hearsay exactly the same with me said george you ought never to believe what people tell you everyone told me your middle name was nero and that don't interrupt me i wasn't i was just pointing out to be quiet I say I have changed my opinion of you to a great extent. I mention this unofficially, as a matter that has no bearing on the main issue, for, as regards any idea you may have of inducing me to agree to your marrying my daughter, let me tell you that I am unalterably opposed to any such thing. Oh, don't say that. What the devil do you mean, don't say that? I do say that. It is out of the question. Do you understand? Very well, then. Good morning. The door closed. Lord Marshmoreton walked away, feeling that he had been commendably stern. George filled his pipe and sat smoking thoughtfully. He wondered what Maud was doing at that moment. Maud, at that moment, was greeting her brother with a bright smile as he limped downstairs after a belated shave and change of costume. 
"'Oh, Percy, dear,' she was saying, "'I had quite an adventure this morning. "'An awful tramp followed me for miles. "'Such a horrible-looking brute. "'I was so frightened that I had to ask a curate in the next village to drive him away. "'I did wish I had had you there to protect me. "'Why don't you come out with me sometimes when I take a country walk? "'It really isn't safe for me to be alone.' End of chapter 16 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Damsel in Distress by P. G. Woodhouse Read by Yas Pistachio in Waxhaw, North Carolina Chapter 17 The Gift of Hiding Private Emotion and keeping up appearances before strangers is not, as many suppose, entirely a product of our modern civilization. Centuries before we were born or thought of, there was a widely press-agented boy in Sparta, who even went so far as to let a fox gnaw his tender young stomach without permitting the discomfort inseparable from such a proceeding to interfere with either his facial expression or his flow of small talk. Historians have handed it down that, even in the latter stages of the meal, the polite lad continued to be the life and soul of the party. But while this fate may be said to have established a record never subsequently lowered, there is no doubt that almost every day in modern times men and women are performing similar and scarcely less impressive miracles of self-restraint. Of all the qualities which belong exclusively to man— and are not shared by the lower animals, this, surely, is the one which marks him off most sharply from the beasts of the field. Animals care nothing about keeping up appearances. Observe Bertram the bull when things are not going just as he could wish. He stamps, he snorts, he paws the ground, he throws back his head and bellows. He is upset, and he doesn't care who knows it. Instances could be readily multiplied— deposit a charge of shot in some outlying section of Thomas the Tiger, and note the effect. Irritate Wilfred the Wasp, or stand behind Maud the Mule and prod her with a pin. There is not an animal on the list who has even a rudimentary sense of the social amenities. And it is this, more than anything else, which should make us proud that we are human beings on a loftier plane of development." In the days which followed Lord Marshmorton's visit to George at the cottage, not a few of the occupants of Belfer Castle had their metal sternly tested in this respect, and it is a pleasure to be able to record that not one of them failed to come through the ordeal with success. The general public, as represented by the uncles, cousins, and aunts who had descended on the place to help Lord Belfer celebrate his coming of age, had not a notion— that turmoil lurked beneath the smooth fronts of at least half a dozen of those whom they met in the course of the daily round. Lord Belfer, for example, though he limped rather painfully, showed nothing of the baffled fury which was reducing his weight at the rate of ounces a day. His uncle Francis, the bishop, when he tackled him in the garden on the subject of intemperance, for uncle Francis, like thousands of others, had taken it for granted— on reading the report of the encounter with the policeman and Percy's subsequent arrest, that the affair had been the result of a drunken outburst, had no inkling of the volcanic emotions that seized in his nephew's bosom. He came away from the interview, indeed, feeling that the boy had listened attentively and with a becoming regret, and that there was hope for him after all, provided that he fought the impulse. He little knew that, but for the conventions— which frown on the practice of murdering bishops, Percy would gladly have strangled him with his bare hands and jumped upon the remains. Lord Belfer's case, inasmuch as he took himself extremely seriously, and was not one of those who can extract humour even from their own misfortunes, was perhaps the hardest which comes under our notice. But his sister Maud was also experiencing mental disquietude of no mean order. Everything had gone wrong with Maud, Barely a mile separated her from George, that essential link in her chain of communication with Geoffrey Raymond, but so thickly did it bristle with obstacles and dangers that it might have been a mile of no man's land. Twice, 
since the occasion when the discovery of Lord Marshmoreton at the cottage had caused her to abandon her purpose of going in and explaining everything to George, had she attempted to make the journey. And each time some trifling, maddening accident had brought about failure. Once, just as she was starting, her Aunt Augusta had insisted on joining her for what she described as a nice long walk. And the second time, when she was within a bare hundred yards of her objective, some sort of a cousin popped out from nowhere and forced his loathsome company on her. Foiled in this fashion, she had fallen back in desperation on her second line of attack. She had written a note to George, explaining the whole situation in good, clear phrases, and begging him, as a man of proved chivalry, to help her. It had taken up much of one afternoon, this note, for it was not easy to write, and it had resulted in nothing. She had given it to Albert to deliver, and Albert had returned empty-handed. "'The gentleman said there was no answer, my lady.' "'No answer? But there must be an answer.' "'No answer, my lady. Those were his very words,' stoutly maintained the black-souled boy, who had destroyed the letter within two minutes after it had been handed to him. He had not even bothered to read it. A deep, dangerous, dastardly stripling this, who fought to win, and only to win. The ticket marked R. Bing was in his pocket, and in his ruthless heart a firm resolve that R. Bing and no other should have the benefit of his assistance. Maud could not understand it. That is to say, she resolutely kept herself from accepting the only explanation of the episode that seemed possible. In black and white she had asked George to go to London and see Geoffrey, and arrange for the passage, through himself as a sort of clearing-house, of letters between Geoffrey and herself. She had felt from the first that such a request should be made by her in person, and not through the medium of writing, but surely it was incredible that a man like George, who had been through so much for her, and whose only reason for being in the neighbourhood was to help her, could have coldly refused without even a word. And yet what else was she to think? Now, more than ever, she felt alone in a hostile world. Yet, to her guests, she was bright and entertaining. Not one of them had a suspicion that her life was not one of pure sunshine. Albert, I am happy to say, was thoroughly miserable. The little brute was suffering torments. He was showering anonymous advice to the lovelorn on Reggie Bing, excellent stuff, culled from the pages of weekly papers, of which there was a pile in the housekeeper's room, the property of a sentimental lady's maid, and nothing seemed to come of it. Every day, sometimes twice and thrice a day, he would leave on Reggie's dressing-table significant notes, similar in tone to the one which he had placed there on the night of the ball, but for all the effect they appeared to exercise on their recipient, they might have been blank pages. The choicest quotations from the works of such established writers as Aunt Charlotte of Forget-Me-Not and Dr. Cupid, the heart expert of Home Chat, expended themselves fruitlessly on Reggie. As far as Albert could ascertain, and he was one of those boys who ascertain practically everything within a radius of miles, Reggie positively avoided Maud's society. And this after reading Dr. Cupid's invaluable tip about seeking her company on all occasions, and the dictum of Aunt Charlotte to the effect that many a wooer has won his lady by being persistent. Albert spelled it persistuent, but the effect was the same and rendering himself indispensable by constant little attentions. So far from rendering himself indispensable to Maud by constant little attentions, Reggie, to the disgust of his backer and supporter, seemed to spend most of his time with Alice Faraday. On three separate occasions had Albert been revolted by the sight of his protégé in close association with the Faraday girl, once in a boat on the lake and twice in his grey car. It was enough to break a boy's heart, and it completely spoiled Albert's appetite. A phenomenon attributed, I am glad to say, in the servants' hall to reaction from recent excesses. The moment when Keggs, the butler, called him a greedy little pig, and hoped it would be a lesson to him not to stuff himself at all hours with stolen cakes, was a bitter moment for Albert. 
it is a relief to turn from the contemplation of these tortured souls to the pleasanter picture presented by Lord Marshmorton. Here, undeniably, we have a man without a secret sorrow, a man at peace with the best of all possible worlds. Since his visit to George, a second youth seems to have come upon Lord Marshmorton. He works in his rose garden with a new vim, whistling or even singing to himself stray gay snatches of melodies popular in the eighties. Hear him now as he toils. He has a long garden implement in his hand, and he is sending up the death rate in slug circles with a devastating rapidity. ta ra ra boom die ta ra ra boom and the boom is a death knell. As it rings softly out on the pleasant spring air, another stout slug has made the great change. It is peculiar, this gaiety. It gives one to think. Others have noticed it. His lordship's valet amongst them. "'I'll give you my honest word, Mr. Cakes,' says the valet, odd. "'This very morning I heard the old devil a-singin' in his bath, chirrupin' away like a bloomin' linnet. "'Law,' says Cakes, properly impressed. "'And only last night he give me off a box of cigars and said I was a good faithful feller.' I tell you, there's something happening to the old buster. You mark my words. End of chapter 17 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Damsel in Distress by P. G. Wodehouse as read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk. Chapter 18 Over this complex situation the mind of Keggs, the butler, played like a searchlight. Keggs was a man of discernment and sagacity. He had instinct and reasoning power. Instinct told him that Maud, all unsuspecting the change that had taken place in Albert's attitude toward her romance, would have continued to use the boy as a link between herself and George. And reason, added to an intimate knowledge of Albert, enabled him to see that the latter must inevitably have betrayed her trust. He was prepared to bet a hundred pounds that Albert had been given letters to deliver and had destroyed them. So much was cleared to Keggs. It only remained to settle on some plan of action which would re-establish the broken connection. Keggs did not conceal a tender heart beneath a rugged exterior. He did not mourn over the picture of two loving fellow human beings separated by a misunderstanding, but he did want to win that sweepstake. His position, of course, was delicate. He could not go to Maud and beg her to confide in him. Maud would not understand his motives, and might leap to the not unjustifiable conclusion that he had been at the sherry. No, men were easier to handle than women. As soon as his duties would permit, and in the present crowded condition of the house they were arduous, he set out for George's cottage. "'I trust I do not disturb or interrupt you, sir.' he said, beaming in the doorway like a benevolent high priest. He had doffed his professional manner of austere disapproval, as was his custom in moments of leisure. "'Not at all,' replied George, puzzled. "'Was there anything there was, sir?' Well, "'Come along in and sit down.' "'I would not take the liberty if it's all the same to you, sir. I would prefer to remain standing.' There was a moment of uncomfortable silence. Uncomfortable, that is to say, on the part of George." who was wondering if the butler remembered having engaged him as a waiter only a few nights back. Cakes himself was at his ease. Few things ruffled this man. "'Fine day,' said George. "'Extremely, sir, but for the rain.' "'Oh, is it raining? Sharp downpour, sir.' "'Good for the crops,' said George. "'So one would be disposed to imagine, sir.' Silence fell again. The rain dripped from the eaves. "'If I might speak freely, sir,' said Cakes. "'Sure, shoot.' "'I beg your pardon, sir?' "'I mean, yes. Go ahead.' The butler cleared his throat. <clears> "'Might I begin by remarking that your little affair of the art, if I may use the expression, is no secret in these servants' hall? I have no wish to seem to be taking liberty or presuming, but I should like to intimate that the servants' hall is aware of the facts.' "'You don't have to tell me that,' said George coldly. "'I know all about the sweepstake.' A flicker of embarrassment passed over the butler's large, smooth face, passed, and was gone. "'I did not know that you had been apprised of that little matter, sir. "'But you will doubtless understand and appreciate our point of view. "'A little sport and flutter, nothing more, "'designed to alleviate the monotony of life in the country.' "'Oh, don't apologize," 
said George, and was reminded of a point which had exercised him a little from time to time since his vigil on the balcony. Uh, by the way, if it isn't giving away secrets, who drew Plummer? Sir? Which of you drew a man named Plummer in the sweep? I rather fancy, sir, Keggs' brow wrinkled in thought. I rather fancy it was one of the visiting gentlemen's gentlemen. I gave the point but slight attention at the time. I do not fancy Mr. Plummer's chances. It seemed to me that Mr. Plummer was a negligible quantity. Your knowledge of form is sound. Plummer's out. Indeed, sir. An amiable young gentleman, but lacking in many of the essential qualities. Perhaps he struck you that way, sir? I never met him. Nearly, but not quite. It entered my mind that you might possibly have encountered Mr. Plummer on the night of the ball, sir. Ah, I was wondering if you remembered me. I remember you perfectly, sir, and it was the fact that we had already met, in what one might almost term a social way, that emboldened me to come here today and offer my services as a intermediary, should you feel disposed to avail yourself of them. George was puzzled. Your services? Precisely, sir. I fancy I'm in a position to lend you what might be termed an help in hand. But that's remarkably altruistic of you, isn't it? Sir? I say that is very generous of you. Aren't you forgetting that you drew Mr. Bing? The butler smiled indulgently. You were not quite abreast of the progress of events, sir. Since the original drawing of names, there has been a trifling adjustment. The boy Albert now has Mr. Bing, and I have you, sir. A little amicable arrangement informally conducted in the scullery the night of the ball. Amicable? On my part, entirely so. George began to understand certain things that had been perplexing to him. Then— all this while precisely sir all this while her ladyship under the impression that the boy albert was devoted to her cause has no doubt been placed in a misguided confidence in him the little blighter said keggs abandoning for a moment his company manners and permitting vehemence to take the place of polish i beg your pardon for the expression sir he added gracefully it escaped me inadvertently you think that lady maud gave albert a letter to give to me and that he destroyed it such, I should imagine, must undoubtedly have been the case. The boy has no scruples, no scruples whatsoever. Good Lord! I appreciate your consternation, sir. That must be exactly what has happened. To my way of thinking, there is no doubt of it. It was for that reason that I ventured to come here, in the hope that I might be instrumental in arranging a meeting. The strong distaste which George had had for plotting with this overfed menial began to wan. It might be undignified, he told himself, but it was undeniably practical. And, after all, a man who has plotted with page-boys has little dignity to lose by plotting with butlers. He brightened up. If it meant seeing Maud again, he was prepared to waive the decencies. "'What do you suggest?' he said. "'It being a rainy evening, and everyone indoors playing games and what not,' Keggs was amiably tolerant of the recreations of the aristocracy. You would experience little chance of interruption were you to proceed to the lane outside the east entrance of the castle grounds and wait there. You will find in the field at the roadside a small disused barn only a short way from the gates, where you would be sheltered from the rain. In the meantime, I would inform her ladyship of your movements, and no doubt it would be possible for her to slip off. That sounds all right. It is all right, sir. The chances of interruption may be said to be reduced to a minimum. Shall we say in one hour's time? Very well. "'Then I will wish you good evening, sir. "'Thank you, sir. "'I'm glad to have been of assistance.' "'He withdrew, as he had come, with a large impressiveness. "'The room seemed very empty without him. "'George, with trembling fingers, began to put on a pair of thick boots. "'For some minutes after he had set foot outside the door of the cottage, "'George was inclined to revile the weather for having played him false. "'On this evening, of all evenings, he felt, "'the elements should, so to speak, have rallied round and done their bit.' The air should have been soft and clear, and scented. There should have been an afterglow of sunset in the sky to light him on his way. Instead, the air was full of that peculiar smell of hopeless dampness which comes at the end of a wet English day. The sky was leaden. The rain hissed down in a steady flow, whispering of mud and desolation, making a dreary morass of the lane through which he tramped. A curious sense of foreboding came upon George. It was as if some voice of the night had murmured maliciously in his ear a hint of trouble to come. He felt oddly nervous as he entered the barn. The barn was both dark and dismal. In one of the dark corners an intermittent dripping betrayed the presence of a gap in its ancient roof. A rat scurried across the floor. The dripping stopped and began again. George struck a match and looked at his watch. He was early. Another ten minutes must elapse before he could hope for her arrival. He sat down on a broken wagon which lay on its side against one of the walls. 
depression returned. It was impossible to fight against it in this beast of a barn. The place was like a sepulchre. No one but a fool of a butler would have suggested it as a trysting place. He wondered irritably why places like this were allowed to get into this condition. If people wanted a barn earnestly enough to take the trouble of building one, was it not worth while to keep the thing in proper repair? Waste and futility. That was what it was. That was what everything was, if you came down to it. Sitting here, for instance, was a futile waste of time. She wouldn't come. There are a dozen reasons why she should not come. So what was the use of his courting rheumatism by waiting in this morgue of dead agricultural ambitions? None. Whatever. George went on waiting. And what an awful place to expect her to come to! If by some miracle she did come, where she would be stifled by the smell of mouldy hay, dampened by raindrops, and— reflected George gloomily, as there was another scurry and scutter along the unseen floor, gnawed by rats. You could not expect a delicately nurtured girl, accustomed to all the comforts of a home, to be bright and sunny with a platoon of rats crawling all over her. The grey oblong that was the doorway suddenly darkened. "'Mr. Bevan!' George sprang up. At the sound of her voice every nerve in his body danced in mad exhilaration. He was another man. Depression fell from him like a garment. He perceived that he had misjudged all sorts of things. The evening, for instance, was a splendid evening, not one of those awful, dry, baking evenings which make you feel you can't breathe, but pleasantly moist and full of a delightfully musical patter of rain. And the barn! He had been all wrong about the barn. It was a great little place, comfortable, airy, and cheerful. What could be more invigorating than that smell of hay? Even the rats, he felt, must be pretty decent rats, when you came to know them. "'I'm here.' Maud advanced quickly. His eyes had grown accustomed to the murk, and he could see her dimly. The smell of her damp raincoat came to him like a breath of ozone. He could even see her eyes shining in the darkness, so close was she to him. "'I hope you have not been waiting long.' George's heart was thundering against his ribs. He could scarcely speak. He contrived to emit a— "'No. I didn't think at first I could get away. I had to—' "'Oh!' She broke off with a cry. The rat, fond of exercise like all rats, had made another of its excitable sprints across the floor. A hand clutched nervously at George's arm— found it, and held it. At the touch, the last small fragment of George's self-control fled from him. The world became vague and unreal. There remained of it but one solid fact, the fact that Maud was in his arms, and that he was saying a number of things very rapidly, in a voice that seemed to belong to somebody he had never met before. End of chapter 18「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Damsel in Distress by P. G. Woodhouse. Read by Yas Pistachio in Waxhaw, North Carolina. Chapter 19 With a shock of dismay so abrupt and overwhelming that it was like a physical injury, George became aware that something was wrong. Even as he gripped her, Maud had stiffened with a sharp cry, and now she was struggling, trying to wrench herself free. She broke away from him. He could hear her breathing hard. "'You! You!' she gulped. "'Maud! How dare you!' There was a pause that seemed to George to stretch on and on, endlessly. The rain pattered on the leaky roof, Somewhere in the distance a dog howled dismally. The darkness pressed down like a blanket, stifling thought. "'Good night, Mr. Bevan.' Her voice was ice. "'I didn't think you were that kind of man.' She was moving towards the door, and as she reached it, George's stupor left him. He came back to life with a jerk, shaking from head to foot. All his varied emotions had become one emotion, a cold fury." Stop! Maud stopped. Her chin was tilted, and she was wasting a baleful glare on the darkness. Well, what is it? Her tone increased George's wrath. The injustice of it made him dizzy. At that moment he hated her. He was the injured party. It was he, not she, that had been deceived and made a fool of. I want to say something before you go. I think we had better say no more about it. By the exercise of supreme self-control, George kept himself from speaking until he could choose milder words than those that rushed to his lips. "'I think we will,' he said between his teeth. 
Maud's anger became tinged with surprise. Now that the first shock of the wretched episode was over, the calmer half of her mind was endeavouring to soothe the infuriated half by urging that George's behaviour had been but a momentary lapse, and that a man may lose his head for one wild instant, and yet remain fundamentally a gentleman and a friend. She had begun to remind herself that this man had helped her once, in trouble, and only a day or two before had actually risked his life to save her from embarrassment. When she heard him call to her to stop, she supposed that his better feelings had reasserted themselves, and she had prepared herself to receive with dignity a broken, stammered apology. But the voice that had just spoken with a crisp, biting intensity was not the voice of remorse. It was a very angry man, not a penitent one, who was commanding, not begging her to stop and listen to him. "'Well?' she said again, more coldly this time. She was quite unable to understand this attitude of his. She was the injured party. It was she, not he, who had trusted and been betrayed. "'I should like to explain. Please do not apologize. George ground his teeth in the gloom. "'I haven't the slightest intention of apologizing. I said I would like to explain. When I have finished explaining, you can go.' "'I shall go when I please,' flared Maud. This man was intolerable. There is nothing to be afraid of. There will be no repetition of the incident. Maud was outraged by this monstrous misinterpretation of her words. I am not afraid. Then perhaps you will be kind enough to listen. I won't detain you long. My explanation is quite simple. I have been made a fool of. I seem to be in the position of the tinker in the play— whom everybody conspired to delude into the belief that he was a king. First, a friend of yours, Mr. Bing, came to me and told me that you had confided to him that you loved me. Maud gasped. Either this man was mad, or Reggie Bing was. She chose the politer solution. Reggie Bing must have lost his senses. So I supposed. At least I imagined that he must be mistaken. But a man in love is an optimistic fool, of course— and I had loved you ever since you got into my cab that morning. What? So, after a while, proceeded George, ignoring the interruption, I almost persuaded myself that miracles could still happen, and that what Bing said was true. And when your father called on me and told me the very same thing, I was convinced. It seemed incredible, but I had to believe it. Now it seems that for some inscrutable reason both Bing and your father were making a fool of me. That is all. Good night. Maud's reply was the last which George or any man would have expected. There was a moment's silence, and then she burst into a peal of laughter. It was the laughter of overstrained nerves, but to George's ears it had the ring of genuine amusement. "'I'm glad you find my story entertaining,' he said dryly. He was convinced now that he loathed this girl, and that all he desired was to see her go out of his life for ever. Later, no doubt, the funny side of it will hit me. Just at present my sense of humour is rather dormant. Maud gave a little cry. Oh, I'm so sorry, so sorry, Mr. Bevan. It wasn't that. It wasn't that at all. Oh, I am so sorry. I don't know why I laughed. It certainly wasn't because I thought it funny. It's tragic. There's been a dreadful mistake. I noticed that, said George bitterly. The darkness began to afflict his nerves. I wish to God we had some light. The glare of a pocket-torch smote upon him. "'I brought it to see my way back with,' said Maud, in a curious, small voice. "'It's very dark, across the fields. I didn't light it before because I was afraid somebody might see.' She came towards him, holding the torch over her head. The beam showed her face, troubled and sympathetic, and at the sight— all George's resentment left him. There were mysteries here beyond his unravelling, but of one thing he was certain. This girl was not to blame. She was a thoroughbred, as straight as a wand. She was pure gold. "'I came here to tell you everything,' she said. She placed the torch on the wagon-wheel, so that its ray fell in a pool of light on the ground between them. "'I'll do it now. Only—' Only it isn't so easy now. Mr. Bevan, 
There's a man. There's a man that father and Reggie Bing mistook. They thought. You see, they knew it was you that I was with that day in the cab, and so they naturally thought, when you came down here, that you were the man I had gone to meet that day. The man I. I. The man you love. Yes, said Maud, in a small voice, and there was silence again. George could feel nothing but sympathy. It mastered other emotion in him, even the grey despair that had come with her words. He could feel all that she was feeling. Tell me all about it, he said. I met him in Wales last year. Maud's voice was a whisper. The family found out, and I was hurried back here, and have been here ever since. That day when I met you, I had managed to slip away from home. I had found out that he was in London, and I was going to meet him. Then I saw Percy, and got into your cab. It's been all a horrible mistake. I'm sorry. I see, said George thoughtfully. I see. His heart ached like a living wound. She had told so little, and he could guess so much. This unknown man who had triumphed seemed to sneer scornfully at him from the shadows. I'm sorry, said Maud again. You mustn't feel like that. But how can I help you? That's the point. What is it you want me to do? But I can't ask you now. Of course you can. Why not? Why? Oh, I couldn't. George managed to laugh. It was a laugh that did not sound convincing, even to himself, but it served. That's morbid, he said. Be sensible. You need help. And I may be able to give it. Surely a man isn't barred for ever from doing you a service just because he happens to love you. Suppose you were drowning and Mr. Plummer was the only swimmer within call. Wouldn't you let him rescue you? Mr. Plummer, what do you mean? You've not forgotten that I was a reluctant ear witness to his recent proposal of marriage. Maud uttered an exclamation. I never asked. How terrible of me! Were you much hurt? Hurt? George could not follow her. That night, when you were on the balcony, and. Oh! George understood. Oh, no, hardly at all. A few scratches. I scraped my hands a little. It was a wonderful thing to do, said Maud, her admiration glowing for a man who could treat such a leap so lightly. She had always had a private theory that Lord Leonard, after performing the same fate, had bragged about it for the rest of his life. No, no, nothing, said George, who had since wondered why he had ever made such a to do about climbing up a perfectly stout sheet. It was splendid, George blushed. We are wandering from the main theme, he said. I want to help you. I came here at enormous expense to help you. How can I do it? Maud hesitated. I think you may be offended at me asking such a thing. You needn't. You see, the whole trouble is that I can't get in touch with Geoffrey. He's in London, and I'm here. And any chance I might have of getting to London vanished the day I met you, when Percy saw me in Piccadilly. How did your people find out it was you? They asked me straight out. And you owned up? I had to. I couldn't tell them a direct lie. George thrilled. This was the girl he had doubts of. So then, it was worse than ever. Continued Maud. I daren't risk writing to Geoffrey and having the letter intercepted. I was wondering. I had the idea almost as soon as I found out that you had come here. You want me to take a letter from you and see that it reaches him, and then he can write back to my address and I can smuggle the letter to you? That's exactly what I do want, but I almost didn't like to ask. Why not? I'll be delighted to do it. I'm so grateful. Why, it's nothing. I thought you were going to ask me to look in on your brother and smash another of his hats. Maud laughed delightedly. The whole tension of the situation had been eased for her. More and more she found herself liking George. Yet, deep down in her, she realized with a pang that for him there had been no easing of the situation. She was sad for George. The plumbers of this world she had consigned to what they declared would be perpetual sorrow with scarcely a twinge of regret. But George was different. Poor Percy, 
she said. I don't suppose he'll ever get over it. He will have other hats, but it won't be the same. She came back to the subject nearest her heart. Mr. Bevan, I wonder if you would do just a little more for me? If it isn't criminal, or for that matter, if it is, could you go to Geoffrey and see him and tell him all about me and, and come back and tell me how he looks and what he said and so on? Certainly. What's his name? And where do I find him? I never told you. How stupid of me. His name is Geoffrey Raymond, and he lives with his uncle, Mr. Wilbur Raymond, at 11A Belgrave Square. I'll go to him tomorrow. Thank you ever so much. George got up. The movement seemed to put him in touch with the outer world. He noticed that the rain had stopped, and that stars had climbed into the oblong of the doorway. He had an impression that he had been in the barn a very long time, and confirmed this with a glance at his watch, though the watch, he felt, understated the facts by the length of several centuries. He was abstaining from too close an examination of his emotions, from a prudent feeling that he was going to suffer soon enough without assistance from himself. "'I think you had better be going back,' he said. "'It's rather late. They may be missing you.' Maud laughed happily. "'I don't mind now what they do. But I suppose dinners must be dressed for, whatever happens.' They moved together to the door. "'What a lovely night, after all. I never thought the rain would stop in this world. It's like when you're unhappy, and think it's going on forever.' "'Yes,' said George. Maud held out her hand. "'Good night, Mr. Bevan.' "'Good night.' He wondered if there would be any allusion to the earlier passages of their interview. There was none. Maud was of the class whose education consists mainly of a training in the delicate ignoring of delicate situations. "'Then you will go and see, Geoffrey? "'Tomorrow. "'Thank you ever so much. "'Not at all.' George admired her. The little touch of formality which she had contrived to impart to the conversation struck just the right note, created just the atmosphere which would enable them to part without weighing too heavily on the deeper aspect of that parting. "'You are a real friend, Mr. Bevan.' "'Watch me prove it.' "'Well, I must rush, I suppose. Good night. Good night.' She moved off quickly across the field. Darkness covered her. The dog in the distance had begun to howl again. He had his troubles, too. End of chapter 19「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Damsel in Distress by P. G. Wodehouse, as read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk. Chapter Twenty. Trouble sharpens the vision. In our moments of distress, we can see clearly that what is wrong with this world of ours is the fact that misery loves company and seldom gets it. Toothache is an unpleasant ailment, but if toothache were a natural condition of life, if all mankind were afflicted with toothache at birth, we should not notice it. It is the freedom from aching teeth of all those with whom we come in contact that emphasizes the agony, and, as with toothache, so with trouble. Until our private affairs go wrong, we never realize how bubbling over with happiness the bulk of mankind seems to be. Our aching heart is apparently nothing but a desert island in an ocean of joy. George, waking next morning with a heavy heart, made this discovery before the day was an hour old. The sun was shining, and birds sang merrily, but this did not disturb him. Nature is ever callous to human woes, laughing while we weep, and we grow to take a callousness for granted. What jarred upon George was the infernal cheerfulness of his fellow men. They seemed to be doing it on purpose, triumphing over him, glorying in the fact that, however fate might have shattered him, they were all right. People were happy who had never been happy before. Mrs. Platt, for instance, a grey, depressed woman of middle age, she had seemed hitherto to have few pleasures beyond breaking dishes and relating the symptoms of sick neighbours who were not expected to live through the week. She now sang. 
George could hear her as she prepared his breakfast in the kitchen. At first he had had a hope that she was moaning with pain, but this was dispelled when he had finished his toilet and proceeded downstairs. The sounds she admitted suggested anguish, but the words, when he was able to distinguish them, told another story. Incredible as it might seem, on this particular morning, Mrs. Platt had elected to be light-hearted. What she was singing sounded like a dirge, but actually it was Stop Your Tickling, Jock. And later, when she brought George his coffee and eggs, she spent a full ten minutes prattling as he tried to read his paper, pointing out to him a number of merry murders and sprightly suicides, which otherwise he might have missed. The woman went out of her way to show him that for her, if not for less fortunate people, God this morning was in his heaven, and all was right with the world. Two tramps of supernatural exuberance called at the cottage shortly after breakfast to ask George, whom they had never even consulted about their marriages, to help support their wives and children. Nothing could have been more carefree and debonair than the demeanour of these men. And then Reggie Bing arrived in his grey racing car, more cheerful than any of them. Fate could not have mocked George more subtly. A sorrow's crown of sorrow is remembering happier things, and the sight of Reggie in that room reminded him that on the last occasion, when they had talked together across this same table, it was he who had been in a fool's paradise, and Reggie who had borne a weight of care. Reggie, this morning, was brighter than the shining sun, and gayer than the caroling birds. "'Hello, hello, 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 hello! Topping morning, isn't it?' observed Reggie. "'The sunshine, the birds, the absolute what do you call it of everything and so forth and all that sort of thing if you know what i mean i feel like a two-year-old george who felt older than this by some ninety-eight years groaned in spirit this was more than man was meant to bear i say continued reggie absently reaching out for a slice of bread and smearing it with marmalade this business of marriage now and all that species of rot what i mean to say is what about it not a bad scheme taking it big and large or don't you think so George writhed. The knife twisted in the wound. Surely it was bad enough to see a happy man eating bread and marmalade without having to listen to him talking about marriage. "'Well, anyhow, be that as it may,' said Reggie, biting jovially and speaking in a thick but joyous voice. "'I'm getting married to-day, and chance it. This morning, this very morning, I leap off the dock.' George was startled out of his despondency. "'What?' "'Absolutely, laddie.' George remembered the conventions. "'I congratulate you.' "'Thanks, old man, and not without reason. "'I'm the luckiest fellow alive. "'I hardly know I was alive till now. "'Isn't this rather sudden?' "'Reggie looked a trifle furtive. "'His manner became that of a conspirator. "'I should jolly well say it is sudden. "'It's got to be sudden. "'Dashed sudden and deuced secret. "'If the mater were to hear of it, "'there's no doubt whatever she would form a flying wedge "'and bust up the proceedings with no uncertain voice. "'You see, laddie, it's Miss Faraday I'm marrying, "'and the mater, dear old soul, has other ideas for Reginald.' "'Life's a rummy thing, isn't it? "'What I mean to say, it's—it's it's rummy, don't you know, and all that?' "'Very,' agreed George. "'Who'd have thought a week ago that I'd be sitting in this jolly old chair "'asking you to be my best man? "'Why, a week ago I didn't know you, "'and if anybody had told me Alice Faraday was going to marry me, "'I'd have given one of those hollow, mirthless laughs. "'Do you want me to be your best man?' "'Absolutely, if you don't mind, you see,' said Reggie confidentially. "'It's like this.' "'I've got lots of pals, of course, buzzing about all over London and its outskirts, "'who'd be glad enough to rally round and join the execution squad. "'But you know how it is. "'Their matères are all pals of my matère, "'and I don't want to get them into trouble for aiding and abetting my little show, "'if you understand what I mean. "'Now you're different. "'You don't know the matère, so it doesn't matter to you "'if she rolls round and puts the curse of the bings on you and all that sort of thing. "'Besides, I don't know,' Reggie mused. "'Of course, this is the happiest day of my life,' he proceeded, "'and I'm not saying it isn't, but you know how it is.' "'There's absolutely no doubt that a chappie does not show at his best when he's being married. "'What I mean to say is, he's more or less bound to look a fearful ass, "'and I'm perfectly certain it would put me right off my stroke "'if I felt that some chump like Jack Ferris or Ronnie Fitzgerald "'was trying not to giggle in the background. "'So if you'll be a sportsman and come and hold my hand till the thing's over, "'I shall be eternally grateful. "'Where are you going to be married?' In London. Alice sneaked off there last night. It was easy, as it happened, because by a bit of luck old Marshmoreton had gone to town yesterday morning. Nobody knows why. He doesn't go up to London more than a couple times a year. She's going to meet me at the Savoy, and then the scheme was to toddle round to the nearest register and request the lad to unleash the marriage service. I'm whizzing up in the car, and I'm hoping to be able to persuade you to come with me. Say the word, laddie. George reflected. He liked Reggie, and there was no particular reason in the world why he should not give him aid and comfort in this crisis. True, in his present frame of mind, it would be torture to witness a wedding ceremony, but he ought not to let that stand in the way of helping a friend. All right, 
he said. Stout fellow! I don't know how to thank you. It isn't putting you out or upsetting your plans, I hope, or anything on those lines. Not at all. I had to go up to London today anyway. Well, you can't get there quicker than in my car. She's a hummer. By the way, I've got to ask, how's your little affair coming along? Everything going all right? In a way, said George. He was not equal to confiding his troubles to Reggie. Of course, your trouble isn't like mine was. What I mean is, Maud loves you and all that, and all you've got to think out is a scheme for laying the jolly old family a stymie. It's a pity, almost, that yours isn't a case of having to win the girl like me, because by Jove, laddie, said Reggie with a solemn emphasis, I could help you there. I've got the thing down fine. I've got the infallible dope. George smiled bleakly. You have? You're a useful fellow to have around. I wish you would tell me what it is. But you don't need it. No, of course not. I was forgetting. Reggie looked at his watch. We ought to be shifting in a quarter of an hour or so. I don't want to be late. It appears that there's a catch of some sort in this business of getting married. As far as I can make out, if you roll in after a certain hour, the Johnny in charge of the proceedings gives you the miss in balk, and you have to turn up again next day. However, we shall be all right unless we have a breakdown, and there's not much chance of that. I've been tuning up the old car since seven this morning, and she's sound in wind and limb, absolutely. Oil, petrol, water, air, nuts, bolts, sprockets, carburetor, all present and correct. I've been looking after them like a lot of baby sisters. Well, as I was saying, I've got the dope. A week ago, I was just one of the mugs, didn't know a thing about it, but now! Gaze on me, laddie. You see before you the old Colonel Romeo, the man who knows. It all started on the night of the ball. There was the dickens of a big ball, you know, to celebrate old Boots coming of age, to which poor devil he contributed nothing but the sunshine of his smile, never having learned to dance. On that occasion, a most rummy and extraordinary thing happened. I got pickled to the eyebrows. He laughed happily. Ha! I don't mean that that was a unique occurrence and so forth, because when I was a bachelor, it was rather a habit of mine to get a trifle submerged every now and again on occasions of decent mirth and festivity. But the rummy thing that night was that I showed it. Up till then, I've been told by experts I was a chappie in whom it was absolutely impossible to detect the symptoms. You might get a bit suspicious if you found out I couldn't move, but you could never be certain. On the night of the ball, however, I suppose I had been filling the radiator a trifle too enthusiastically. You see, I had deliberately tried to shove myself more or less below the surface in order to get enough nerve to propose to Alice. I don't know what your experience has been, but mine is that proposing's a thing that simply isn't within the scope of a man who isn't moderately woozled. I've often wondered how marriages ever occur in the dry states of America. Well, as I was saying, on the night of the ball, a most rummy thing happened. I thought one of the waiters was you. He paused impressively to allow this startling statement to sink in. "'And was he?' said George. "'Absolutely not. That was the rummy part of it. He looked as like you as your twin brother.' "'I haven't a twin brother. No, I know what you mean. But what I mean to say is he looked just like your twin brother would have looked if you had had a twin brother. Well, I had a word or two with this chappie, and after a brief conversation it was borne in upon me that I was up to the gills. Alice was with me at the time and noticed it too.' Now you'd have thought that that would have put a girl off a fellow and all that, but no, nobody could have been more sympathetic, and she has confided to me since that it was seeing me in my oiled condition that really turned the scale. What I mean is, she made up her mind to save me from myself. You know how some girls are. Angels, absolutely. Always on the lookout to pluck brands from the burning and what not. You may take it from me that the good seed was definitely sown that night. Is that your recipe, then? You would advise the would-be bridegroom to buy a case of champagne and a wedding license and get to work? After that, it would be all over, except sending out the invitations. Reggie shook his head. Not at all. You need a lot more than that. That's only the start. You've got to follow up the good work, you see. That's where a number of chappies would slip up, and I'm pretty certain I should have slipped up myself. But for another singularly rummy occurrence. Have you ever heard of a, a what do you call it? What's the word I want? One of those things fellows get sometimes. Headaches? Hazarded George. No, no, nothing like that. I don't mean anything you get. I mean something you get, if you know what I mean. Measles? Anonymous letter! That was what I was trying to say. It's a most extraordinary thing, and I can't understand even now where the deuce they came from. But just about then I started to get a whole bunch of anonymous letters from some chappy unknown who didn't sign his name. What you mean is that the letters were anonymous, said George. Absolutely. I used to get two or three a day sometimes. Whenever I went up to my room, I'd find another waiting for me on my dressing table. Offensive? Eh? Were the letters offensive? Anonymous letters usually are. Well, these weren't. Not at all. And quite the reverse. They contained a series of perfectly topping tips on how a fellow should proceed who wants to get a hold of a girl. It sounds as though somebody had been teaching you jiu-jitsu by post. They were great. 
real red-hot stuff right from the stable priceless tips like make yourself indispensable to her in little ways study her tastes and so on and so forth i tell you laddie i pretty soon stopped worrying about who was sending them to me and concentrated the old bean on acting on them they worked like magic the last one came yesterday morning and it was a topper it was all about how a chappie who was nervous should proceed technical stuff you know about holding her hand and telling her you're lonely and being sincere and straightforward and letting your heart dictate the rest have you ever asked for one card when you wanted to fill a royal flush and happened to pick out the necessary ace i did once when i was up at oxford and by jove this letter gave me just the same thrill i didn't hesitate i just sailed in i was cold sober but i didn't worry about that something told me i couldn't lose it was like having to hole out a three-inch putt and well there you are don't you know reggie became thoughtful dash it all i'd like to know who the fellow was who sent me those letters i'd like to send him a wedding present or a bit of the cake or something though i suppose there won't be any cake seeing the things taking place at a registrar's you could buy a bun suggested george well i shall never know i suppose and now how about trickling forth i say laddie you don't object if i sing slightly from time to time during the journey i'm so dashed happy you know not at all if it's not against the traffic regulations reggie wandered aimlessly about the room in an ecstasy it's a rummy thing he said meditatively i've just remembered that when i was at school i used to sing a thing called the what its name's wedding song at house suppers don't you know and what not jolly little thing i dare say you know it it starts ding dong ding dong or words to that effect hurry along for it's my wedding morning i remember you had to stretch out the more a bit deuce it awkward if you haven't laid in enough breath the yeoman's wedding song that was it i knew it was some chappy or others and it went on and the bride in something or other doing something i can't recollect well what i mean is now it's my wedding morning rummy when you come to think of it what well as it's getting tolerable late what about it shift ho i'm ready would you like me to bring some rice thank you laddie no dash dangerous stuff rice worse than shrapnel got your hat all set i'm waiting then let the revels commence said reggie ding dong ding dong hurry along for it's my wedding morning and the bride dash it i wish i could remember what the bride was doing probably writing you a note to say that she's changed her mind and it's all off oh my god exclaimed reggie come on end of chapter twenty this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a Damsel in Distress by P. G. Woodhouse Read by Yas Pistachio in Waxhaw, North Carolina Chapter 21 Mr. and Mrs. Reginald Bing, seated at a table in the corner of the Regent Grill-room, gazed fondly into each other's eyes. George, seated at the same table, but feeling many miles away, watched them moodily, fighting to hold off a depression which, cured for a while by the exhilaration of the ride in Reggie's racing-car—it had beaten its previous record for the trip to London by nearly twenty minutes—now threatened to return. The gay scene, the ecstasy of Reggie, the more restrained but equally manifest happiness of his bride, these things induced melancholy in George. He had not wished to attend the wedding lunch— but the happy pair seemed to be revolted at the idea that he should stroll off and get a bite to eat somewhere else. "'Stick by us, laddie,' Reggie had said pleadingly, "'for there is much to discuss, and we need the counsel of a man of the world. We are married all right.' "'Though it didn't seem legal in that little registrar's office,' put in Alice. "'But that, as the blighters say in books, is but a beginning, not an end.' We have now to think about the most tactful way of letting the news seep through, as it were, to the mater. "'And Lord Marshmorton,' said Alice, "'don't forget he has lost his secretary.' "'And Lord Marshmorton,' amended Reggie, "'and about a million other people who will be most frightfully peeved at my doing the wedding glide without consulting them. Stick by us, old top. Join our simple meal. And over the old coronas we'll discuss many things.' The arrival of a waiter with the dishes broke up the silent communion between husband and wife, and lowered Reggie to a more earthly plane. He refilled the glasses from the stout bottle that nestled in the ice-bucket. "'Only this one, dear,' murmured the bride in a warning undertone, and, "'All right, darling,' replied the dutiful groom, and raised his own to his lips. 
Cheerio! Here's to us all. Maddest, merriest day of all the glad new year, and so forth. And now, he continued, becoming sternly practical, about the good old sequel and aftermath, so to speak, of this little binge of ours, what's to be done? You are a brainy sort of fellow, Bevan, old man, and we look to you for suggestions. How would you set about breaking the news to mother? Write her a letter, said George. Reggie was profoundly impressed. "'Didn't I tell you he would have some devilish shrewd scheme?' he said enthusiastically to Alice. "'Write her a letter! What could be better? Poetry, by gad!' His face clouded. "'But what would you say in it? That's a pretty naughty point.' "'Not at all. Be perfectly frank and straightforward. Say you are sorry to go against her wishes.' "'Wishes,' murmured Reggie, scribbling industrially on the back of the marriage license. "'But you know that all she wants is your happiness.' Reggie looked doubtful. "'I'm not sure about that last bit, old thing. You don't know the mater.' "'Never mind, Reggie,' put in Alice. "'Say it anyhow. Mr. Bevan is perfectly right.' "'Right ho, darling. All right, laddie. Happiness. And then?' Point out in a few well-chosen sentences how charming Mrs. Bing is. Mrs. Bing! Reggie smiled fatuously. I don't think I ever heard anything that sounded so indescribably ripping. That part will be easy enough. Besides, the mater knows Alice. Lady Caroline has seen me at the castle, said his bride doubtfully. But I shouldn't say she knows me. She has hardly spoken a dozen words to me. There! said Reggie earnestly. "'You're in luck, dear heart. The mater's a great speaker, especially in moments of excitement. I'm not looking forward to the time when she starts on me. Between ourselves, laddie, and meaning no disrespect to the dear old soul, when the mater is moved and begins to talk, she uses up most of the language. Outspoken, is she? I should hate to meet the person who could outspeak her,' said Reggie. George sought information on a delicate point— "'And financially? Does she exercise any authority over you in that way?' "'You mean, has the mater the first call on the family doubloons?' said Reggie. "'Oh, absolutely not. You see, when I call her the mater, it's usually the word in a loose sense, so to speak. She's my stepmother, really. She has her own little collection of pieces of eight, and I have mine. That's part simple enough.' "'Then the whole thing is simple. I don't see what you've been worrying about.' "'Just what I keep telling him, Mr. Bevan,' said Alice. "'You're a perfectly free agent. She has no hold of you of any kind.' Reggie Bing blinked dizzily. "'Why, now you put it like that,' he exclaimed. "'I can see that I jolly well am. It's an amazing thing, you know, habit and all that. I've been so accustomed for years to jumping through hoops and shamming dead when the mater lifted a little finger— that it absolutely never occurred to me that I had a soul of my own. I give you my honest word I never saw it till this moment. And now it's too late. Eh? George indicated Alice with a gesture. The newly made Mrs. Bing smiled. Mr. Bevan means that now you've got to jump hoops and sham dead when I lift a little finger. Reggie raised her hand to his lips and nibbled at it gently. Bless him's little finger, it shan't lift and have him's Reggie jumping through— he broke off, and tendered George a manly apology. Oh, "'Sorry, old top. Forgot myself for the moment. Shan't occur again. Have another chicken, or an eclair, or some soup, or something.' Over the cigars, Reggie became expansive. "'Now that you've lifted the frightful weight of Mater off my mind, dear old lad,' he said, puffing luxuriously, "'I find myself surveying the future in a calmer spirit. It seems to me that the best thing to do, as regards the Mater and everybody else, is simply to prolong the merry wedding trip till time the great healer has had a chance to cure the wound. Alice wants to put in a week or so in Paris. Paris, murmured the bride ecstatically. Then I would like to trickle southwards to the Riviera. If you mean Monte Carlo, dear, said his wife with gentle firmness, no. Oh, no, not Monte Carlo, said Reggie hastily, though it's a great place, air, scenery, and what not. "'But Nice, and Bordighera, and Mentone, and other fairly ripe resorts. You'd enjoy them. And after that—' 
I had a scheme for buying back my yacht, the jolly old siren, and cruising about the Mediterranean for a month or so. I sold her to a local sportsman when I was in America a couple of years ago. But I saw in the paper yesterday that the poor old buffer had died suddenly, so I suppose it would be difficult to get hold of her for the time being. Reggie broke off with a sharp exclamation. "'My sainted aunt!' "'What's the matter?' Both his companions were looking past him, wide-eyed. George occupied the chair that had its back to the door, and was unable to see what it was that had caused their consternation. But he deduced that someone known to both of them must have entered the restaurant, and his first thought, perhaps naturally, was that it must be Reggie's mater. Reggie dived behind a menu, which he held before him like a shield and his bride, after one quick look, had turned away so that her face was hidden. George swung round, but the newcomer, whoever he or she was, was now seated and indistinguishable from the rest of the lunchers. "'Who is it?' Reggie laid down the menu with the air of one who, after a momentary panic, rallies. "'Don't know what I'm making such a fuss about,' he said stoutly. "'I keep forgetting that none of these blighters really matter in the scheme of things.' "'I've a good mind to go over and pass the time of day.' "'Oh, don't,' pleaded his wife. "'I feel so guilty.' "'Who is it?' asked George again. "'Your stepmother?' "'Great Scott, no,' said Reggie. "'Nothing so bad as that. "'It's old Marshmorton.' "'Lord Marshmorton?' "'Absolutely, and looking positively festive.' "'I feel so awful, Mr. Bevan,' said Alice. "'You know I left the castle without a word to any one and he doesn't know yet that there won't be any secretary waiting for him when he gets back. Reggie took another look over George's shoulder and chuckled. "'It's all right, darling, don't worry. We can nip off secretly by the other door. He's not going to stop us. He's got a girl with him. The old boy has come to life, absolutely. He's gassing away sixteen to the dozen to a frightfully pretty girl with gold hair. If you slew the old bean round at an angle of about forty-five, Bevan, old top, you can see her.' "'Take a look. He won't see you. He's got his back to us.' "'Do you call her pretty?' asked Alice, disparagingly. "'Now that I take a good look, precious,' replied Reggie, with alacrity, "'no, absolutely not. Not my style at all.' His wife crumbled bread. "'I think she must know you, Reggie, dear,' she said softly. "'She's waving to you.' "'She's waving to me.' said George, bringing back the sunshine to Reggie's life, and causing the latter's face to lose its hunted look. "'I know her very well. Her name is Dor, Billy Dor.' "'Old man,' said Reggie, "'be a good fellow, and slide over to their table and cover our retreat. I know there's nothing to be afraid of, really, but I simply can't face the old boy.' "'And break the news to him that I've gone, Mr. Bevan,' said Alice. "'Very well. I'll say good-bye, then.' "'Good-bye, Mr. Bevan, and thank you ever so much.' Reggie shook George's hand warmly. "'Good-bye, Bevan, old thing. You're a ripper. I can't tell you how bucked up I am at the sportsmanlike way you've rallied round. I'll do the same for you one of these days. Just hold the old boy in play for a minute or two while we leg it. And if he wants us, tell him our address till further notice is Paris. What ho, what ho, what ho! Toodaloo, laddie, toodaloo!' George threaded his way across the room. Billy Dore welcomed him with a friendly smile. The Earl, who had turned to observe his progress, seemed less delighted to see him. His weather-beaten face wore an almost furtive look. He reminded George of a schoolboy who has been caught in some breach of the law. "'Fancy seeing you here, George,' said Billy. "'We're always meeting, aren't we? How did you come to separate yourself from the pigs and chickens?' "'I thought you were never going to leave them.' "'I had to run up on business,' explained George. "'How are you, Lord Marshmorton?' The Earl nodded briefly. "'So you're on to him, too,' said Billy. "'When did you get wise?' "'Lord Marshmorton was kind enough to call on me the other morning and drop the incognito.' "'Isn't Dada the foxiest old thing?' said Billy delightedly. "'Imagine him standing there that day in the garden.' kidding us along like that. I tell you, when they brought me his card last night after the first act, and I went down to take a slant at this Lord Marshmorton and found Dada hanging round the stage door, you could have knocked me over with a whisk-broom. 
"'I have not stood at a stage door for twenty-five years,' said Lord Marshmorton sadly. "'Now it's no use your pulling that Henry W. Methuselah stuff,' said Billy affectionately. "'You can't get away with it. Anyone can see you're just a kid. Can't they, George?' She indicated the blushing Earl with a wave of the hand. "'Isn't Dada the youngest thing that ever happened?' "'Exactly what I told him myself.' Lord Marshmorton giggled. There is no other verb that describes the sound that proceeded from him. "'I feel young,' he admitted. "'I wish some of the juveniles in the shows I've been in,' said Billy, "'were as young as you. It's getting so nowadays that one's thankful if a juvenile has teeth.' She glanced across the room. "'Your pals are walking out on you, George. The people you were lunching with,' she explained. "'They're leaving.' "'That's all right. I said good-bye to them.' He looked at the Lord Marshmorton. It seemed a suitable opportunity to break the news. "'I was lunching with Mr. and Mrs. Bing,' he said. Nothing appeared to stir beneath Lord Marshmorton's tanned forehead. "'Reggie Bing and his wife, Lord Marshmorton,' added George. This time he secured the Earl's interest. Lord Marshmorton started. "'What?' "'They are just off to Paris,' said George. "'Reggie Bing is not married?' "'Married this morning. I was best man.' "'Busy little creature,' interjected Billy. "'But—but—' "'You know his wife,' said George casually. "'She was a Miss Faraday. I think she was your secretary.' It would have been impossible to deny that Lord Marshmorton showed emotion. His mouth opened, and he clutched the tablecloth— but just what the emotion was, George was unable to say, till, with a sigh that seemed to come from his innermost being, the other exclaimed, "'Thank heaven!' George was surprised. "'You're glad?' "'Of course I'm glad!' "'It's a pity they didn't know how you were going to feel. It would have saved them a lot of anxiety. I rather gathered they supposed that the shock was apt to darken your whole life.' "'That girl!' said Lord Marshmorton vehemently, was driving me crazy, always bothering me to come up and work on that damned family history. Never gave me a moment's peace. "'I liked her,' said George. "'Nice enough, girl,' admitted his lordship grudgingly. "'But a damned nuisance about the house, always at me to go on with a family history, as if there weren't better things to do with one's time than writing all day about my infernal fools of ancestors.' "'Isn't Dada fractious to-day?' said Billy reprovingly, giving the Earl's hand a pat. "'Quit knocking your ancestors. You're very lucky to have ancestors. I wish I had. The Dorr family seems to go back about as far as the presidency of Willard Fillmore, and then it kind of gets discouraged and quite cold. Gee, I'd like to think that my great-great-great-grandmother had helped Queen Elizabeth with the rent. I'm strong for the fine old stately families of England.' "'Stately old fiddlesticks!' snapped the Earl. "'Did you see his eyes flash then, George? That's what they call aristocratic rage. It's the fine old spirit of the Marshmortons boiling over.' "'I noticed it,' said George. "'Just like lightning.' "'It's no use trying to fool us, Dada,' said Billy. "'You know just as well as I do that it makes you feel good to think that every time you cut yourself with your safety razor you bleed blue.' "'A lot of silly nonsense,' grumbled the Earl. "'What is?' "'This foolery of titles and aristocracy, silly fetish worship. One man's as good as another.' "'This is the spirit of seventy six, said George approvingly. "'Regular I.W.W. stuff,' agreed Billy. "'Shake hands the President of the Bolshevik.' Lord Marshmorton ignored the interruption. There was a strange look in his eyes— it was evident to George, watching him with close interest, that here was a revelation of the man's soul, that thoughts, locked away for years in the other's bosom, were crying for utterance. "'Damned silly nonsense! When I was a boy I wanted to be an engine driver. When I was a young man I was a socialist, and hadn't any idea except to work for my living and make a name for myself. I was going to the colonies, Canada. The fruit farm was actually bought, bought and paid for.' He brooded a moment on that long-lost fruit-farm. "'My father was a younger son, and then my uncle must go and break his neck hunting, and the baby, 
poor little chap, got croup or something. And there I was, saddled with the title, and all my plans gone up in smoke. Silly nonsense, silly nonsense. He bit at the end of a cigar. And you can't stand up against it, he went on ruefully. It saps you. It's like some damned drug. I fought against it as long as I could, but it was no use. I'm as big a snob as any of them now. I'm afraid to do what I want to do. Always thinking of the family dignity. I haven't taken a free step for twenty-five years. George and Billy exchanged glances. Each had the uncomfortable feeling that they were eavesdropping and hearing things not meant to be heard. George rose. I must be getting on now, he said. I've one or two things to do. Glad to have seen you again, Billy. Is the show going all right? Fine. Making money for you right along. Good bye, Lord Marshmorton. The Earl nodded without speaking. It was not often now that he rebelled even in thoughts against the lot which fate had thrust upon him, and never in his life before had he done so in words. He was still in the grip of the strange discontent which had come upon him so abruptly. There was a silence after George had gone. I'm glad we met George, said Billy. He's a good boy. She spoke soberly. She was conscious of a curious feeling of affection for the sturdy, weather tanned little man opposite her. The glimpse she had been given of his inner self had somehow made him come alive for her. He wants to marry my daughter, said Lord Marshmorton. A few moments before, Billy would undoubtedly have replied to such a statement with some jocular remark, expressing disbelief that the Earl could have a daughter old enough to be married. But now she felt oddly serious, and unlike her usual flippant self. Oh? was all she could find to say. She wants to marry him. Not for years had Billy Dorr felt embarrassed, but she felt so now. She judged herself unworthy to be the recipient of these very private confidences. Oh, she said again. He's a good fellow. I like him. I liked him the moment we met. He knew it, too, and I knew that he liked me. A group of men and girls from a neighboring table passed on their way to the door. One of the girls nodded to Billy. She returned the nod absently. The party moved on. Billy frowned down at the tablecloth and drew a pattern on it with a fork. Why don't you let George marry your daughter, Lord Marshmorton? The Earl drew at his cigar in silence. I know it's not my business, said Billy apologetically, interrupting the silence as a rebuff, because I'm the Earl of Marshmorton. I see. No, you don't, snapped the Earl. You think I mean by that that I think your friend isn't good enough to marry my daughter. You think that I'm an incurable snob, and I've no doubt he thinks so too, though I took the trouble to explain my attitude to him when we last met. You're wrong. It isn't that at all. When I say I'm the Earl of Marshmorton, I mean that I'm a poor, spineless fool who's afraid to do the right thing because he daren't go in the teeth of the family. I don't understand. What have your family to do with it? They'd worry the life out of me. I wish you could meet my sister Caroline. That's what they've got to do with it. Girls in my daughter's unfortunate position have got to marry position or money. Well, I don't know about position, but when it comes to money, why, George is the fellow that made the dollar bill famous. He and Rockefeller have got all there is, except the little bit they have let Andy Carnegie have for car fare. What do you mean? He told me he worked for a living. Billy was becoming herself again. Embarrassment had fled. If you call it work, he's a composer. I know. Writes tunes and things. Billy regarded him compassionately. "'And I suppose, living out in the woods the way that you do, that you haven't a notion that they pay him for it?' "'Pay him? Yes. But how much? Composers were not rich men in my day.' "'I wish you wouldn't talk of your day as if you were telling the boys down at the corner store about the good times they all had before the flood. You're one of the younger set, and don't let me have to tell you again. Say, listen—' You know that show you saw last night? The one where I was supported by a few underlings? Well, 
George wrote the music for that. I know. He told me so. Well, did he tell you that he draws three per cent of the gross receipts? You saw the house we had last night. It was a fair average house. We are playing to over fourteen thousand dollars a week. George's little bit of that is, I can't do it in my head, but it's around four hundred dollars. That's eighty pounds of your money. And did he tell you that this same show ran over a year in New York? To big business all the time, and that there are three companies on the road now? And did he mention that this is just the ninth show he's done, and that seven of the others were just as big hits as this one? And did he remark in passing that he gets royalties on every copy of his music that's sold, and that at least ten of his things have sold over half a million? No, he didn't, because he isn't the sort of fellow who stands around blowing about his income. But you know it now. Why, he's a rich man. <laughs> I don't know what you call rich, but keeping on the safe side, I should say that George pulls down in a good year during the season around five thousand dollars a week. Lord Marshmorton was frankly staggered. A thousand pounds a week? I had no idea. I thought you hadn't. And while I'm boosting George, let me tell you another thing. He's one of the whitest men that ever happened. I know him. You can take it from me. If there's anything rotten in a fellow, the show business will bring it out. And it hasn't come out in George yet, so I guess it isn't there. George is all right. He has at least an excellent advocate. Oh, I'm strong for George. I wish there were more like him. Well, if you think I've butted in on your private affairs sufficiently, I suppose I ought to be moving. We've a rehearsal this afternoon. Let it go, said Lord Marshmorton boyishly. Yes, and how quick do you think they would let me go if I did? I'm an honest working girl, and I can't afford to lose jobs. Lord Marshmorton fiddled with his cigar butt. I could offer you an alternative position if you cared to accept it. Billy looked at him keenly. Other men in similar circumstances had made much the same remark to her. She was conscious of feeling a little disappointed in her new friend. Well, she said dryly, shoot. You gathered, no doubt, from Mr. Bevan's conversation, that my secretary has left me and run away and got married. Would you like to take her place? It was not easy to disconcert Billy Dore, but she was taken aback. She had been expecting something different. You're a shriek, Dada. I'm perfectly serious. Can you see me at a castle? I can see you perfectly. Lord Marshmorton's rather formal manner left him. Do please accept, my dear child. I've got to finish this damned family history some time or other. The family expect me to. Only yesterday my sister Caroline got me in a corner, and bored me for half an hour about it. I simply can't face the prospect of getting another Alice Faraday from an agency. Charming girl. Charming girl, of course. But, but, well, I'll be damned if I do it. And that's the long and short of it. Billy bubbled over with laughter. Of all the impulsive kids, she gurgled, I never met anyone like you, Dada. You don't even know that I can use a typewriter. I do. Mr. Bevan told me you were an excellent stenographer. So George has been boosting me, too, has he? She mused. I must say, I'd love to come. That old place got me when I saw it the other day. Then it's settled, said Lord Marshmorton masterfully. Go to the theatre and tell them— "'Tell them whatever is usual in these cases. "'And then go home and pack, "'and meet me at the Waterloo at six o'clock. "'The train leaves at six fifteen. "'Return of the Wanderer, accompanied by Dizzy Blonde. "'You've certainly got it all fixed, haven't you? "'Do you think the family will stand for me?' "'Damn the family,' said Lord Marshmorton stoutly. "'There's one thing,' said Billy complacently, "'eyeing her reflection in the mirror of her vanity case.' I may glitter in the fighting top, but it is genuine. When I was a kid, I was a regular little towhead. I never supposed for a moment that it was anything but genuine. Then you've got a fine, unsuspicious nature, Dada, and I admire you for it. Six o'clock at the Waterloo, said the Earl. I'll be waiting for you. Billy regarded him with affectionate admiration. 
"'Boys will be boys,' she said. "'All right. I'll be there.'" End of chapter 21「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Damsel in Distress by P. G. Wodehouse. As read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk. Chapter 22 Young Blighted Albert said Keggs the butler, shifting his weight so that it distributed itself more comfortably over the creaking chair in which he reclined. "'Let this be a lesson to you, young fellow, me lad.' The day was a week after Lord Marshmoreton's visit to London, the hour six o'clock. The housekeeper's room, in which the upper servants took their meals, had emptied. Of the gay company which had just finished dinner, only Keggs remained, placidly digesting. Albert— whose duty it was to wait on the upper servants, was moving to and fro, morosely collecting the plates and glasses. The boy was in no happy frame of mind. Throughout dinner the conversation at table had dealt almost exclusively with the now celebrated elopement of Reggie Bing and his bride, and few subjects could have made more painful listening to Albert. "'What's been the result in what I might call the upshot?' said Keggs, continuing his homily, of all your making yourself so busy and thrusting yourself forward and meddling in the affairs of your elders and betters. The upshot, the issue of it, has been that you are out five shillings and nothing to show for it. Five shillings what you might have spent on some good book and improved your mind, and goodness knows it wants all the improving it can get, for all the worthless, idle little messes it's ever been my misfortune to have dealings with. You are the champion. Be careful of them plates, young man, and don't breathe so hard. "'You haven't got Hasma or something, have you?' "'I can't breathe now,' complained the stricken child. "'Not like a grampus, you can't, and don't you forget it.' Keggs wagged his head reprovingly. "'Well, so your Reggie Bing's gone and eloped, has he? "'That ought to teach you to be more careful another time "'how you go gambling and plunging into sweepstakes. "'The idea of a child of your age having the audacity to thrust hisself forward like that. "'Don't call him my Reggie Bing. I didn't draw him. "'There's no need to go into all that again, young feller.' You accepted him freely and without prejudice when the fair exchange was suggested, so for all practical intents and purposes, he is your Reggie Bing, and I hope you're going to send him a wedding present. Well, you ain't any better off than me with all your highway robbery. My what? You heard what I said. Well, don't let me hear it again. The idea. If you had any objections to partnering with that ticket, you should have stated them clearly at the time. And what do you mean by saying I ain't any better off than you are? I have my reasons. You think you have which is a very different thing. I suppose you imagine that you've put a stopper on a certain little affair by surreptitiously destroying letters entrusted to you. I never! exclaimed Albert with a convulsive start that nearly sent eleven plates dashing to destruction. How many times have I got to tell you to be careful of them plates? said Keggs sternly. Who do you think you are, a juggler of the oars, earning them about like that? Yes, I know all about that letter. You thought you was a very clever, I've no doubt. But let me tell you, young blighted Albert, that only the other evening her ladyship and Mr. Bevan had a long and extended interview in spite of all your efforts. I saw through your little game, and I proceeded and went and arranged the meeting. In spite of himself, Albert was awed. He was oppressed by the sense of struggling with the superior intellect. Yes, you did, he managed to say with the proper tone of incredulity, but in his heart he was not incredulous. Dimly, Albert had begun to perceive that years must elapse before he could become capable of matching himself in battles of wits with this master strategist. "'Yes, I certainly did,' said Keggs. "'I don't know what happened at the interview, not being present in person, but I've no doubt that everything proceeded satisfactorily. "'And a fat lot of good that's going to do you when he ain't allowed to come inside the house!' A bland smile irradiated the butler's moonlike face. "'If by e you are alluding to Mr. Bevan, young blighted Albert, let me tell you that it won't be long before he comes a regular, duly invited guest to the castle. A lot of chance! Would you care to have another five shillings even money on it?' Albert recoiled. He had had enough of speculation where the butler was concerned. Where that schemer was allowed to get within reach of it, hard cash melted away. "'What are you going to do?' "'Never you mind what I'm going to do.' I have my methods. 
all i have to say to you is that to-morrow or the day after mr bevan will be seated in our dining hall with his feet under our table replying according to his personal taste and preference when i ask him if he'll have ock or sherry brush all them crumbs carefully off the tablecloth young blighted albert don't shuffle your feet Breathe softly through your nose and close the door behind you when you've finished i'll oh, go and eat cake said albert bitterly but he said it to his immortal soul not aloud and the lad's spirit was broken Keggs, the processes of digestion completed, presented himself before Lord Belpher in the billiard-room. Percy was alone. The house-party, so numerous on the night of the ball and on his birthday, had melted down now to reasonable proportions. The second and third cousins had retired, flushed and gratified, to obscure dens from which they had emerged, and the castle housed only the more prominent members of the family, always harder to dislodge than the small fry. The bishop still remained, and the colonel. Besides these, there were perhaps half a dozen more of the closer relations. To Lord Belpher's way of thinking, half a dozen too many. He was not fond of his family. "'Might I have a word with your lordship?' "'What is it, Keggs?' Keggs was a self-possessed man, but he found it a little hard to begin. Then he remembered that once, in the misty past, he had seen Lord Belpher spanked for stealing jam he himself having acted on that occasion as prosecuting attorney, and the memory nerved him. "'I earnestly hope that your lordship will not think that I am taking a liberty. I have been in his lordship's for your father's service many years now, and the family honour is, if I may be pardoned for saying so, extremely near to my heart. I have known your lordship since you were a mere boy, and—' Lord Belpher had listened with growing patience to this preamble— his temper was seldom at its best these days, and the rolling periods annoyed him. "'Yes, yes, of course,' he said. "'What is it?' Keggs was himself now. In his opening remarks he had simply been, as it were, winding up. He was now prepared to begin. "'Your lordship will recall inquiring of me on the night of the ball as to the bona fides of one of the temporary waiters. The one that stated that he was the cousin of young blight of the boy Albert the page?' i have been making inquiries your lordship and i regret to say i find that the man was an impostor he informed me that he was albert's cousin but albert now informs me that he has no cousin in america i am extremely sorry this should have occurred your lordship and i hope you will attribute it to the bustle and haste inseparable from the duties as mine on such occasion i know the fellow was an impostor he was probably after the spoons keggs coughed if i might be allowed to take a further liberty your lordship my eye suggests that I am aware of the man's identity and of his motive for visiting the castle. He waited a little apprehensively. This was the crucial point in the interview. If Lord Belpher did not now freeze him with a glance and order him from the room, the danger would be past, and he could speak freely. His light blue eyes were expressionless as they met Percy's, but inwardly he was feeling much the same sensation as he was wont to experience when the family was in town, and he had managed to slip off to Kempton Park or some other race-course, and put some of his savings on a horse. As he felt when the racing steeds thundered down the straight, so did he feel now. Astonishment showed in Lord Belpher's round face. Just as it was about to be succeeded by indignation, the butler spoke again. I am aware, your lordship, that it is not my place to offer suggestions as to the private and intimate affairs of the family I have the honour to serve, but if your lordship would consent to overlook the liberty, I think I could be of help and assistance in a matter which is causing annoyance and unpleasantness to all. He invigorated himself with another dip into the waters of memory. Yes, the young man before him might be Lord Belpher, son of his employer and heir to all these great estates, but once he had seen him spanked. Perhaps Percy also remembered this. Perhaps he merely felt that Keggs was a faithful old servant, and, as such, entitled to thrust himself into the family affairs. Whatever his reasons, he now definitely lowered the barrier. "'Well,' he said, with a glance at the door, to make sure that there were no witnesses to an act of which the aristocrat in him disapproved, "'go on.' Keggs breathed freely. The danger point was past. "'Having a natural interest in your lordship,' he said, we of the servants all generally manage to become respectfully aware of whatever happens to be transpiring above stairs. May I say that I became acquainted at an early stage with the trouble which your lordship is unfortunately having with a certain party? Lord Belpher, although his whole being revolted against what practically amounted to hobnobbing with a butler, perceived that he had committed himself to the discussion. It revolted him to think that these delicate family secrets were the subject of conversation in menial circles, 
but it was too late to do anything now and such was the whole-heartedness with which he had declared war upon george bevan that at this stage in the proceedings his chief emotion was a hope that keggs might have something sensible to suggest i think begging your lordship's pardon for making the remark that you are acting injudicious i have been in service a great number of years starting as a steward's room boy and rising to my present position and i may say i have had experience during those years of several different cases where the daughter or son of the house contemplated a misalliance and all but one of the cases ended disastrously your lordship on account of the family trying opposition it is my experience that opposition in matters of the art is useless feeding as it so to speak does the flame young people your lordship if i may be pardoned for employing the expression in the present case are naturally romantic and if you keep em away from a thing they sit and pity themselves and want it all the more and in the end you may be sure they get it there's no way of stopping em i was not on sufficiently easy terms with the late lord warlingham to give him the benefit of my experience on the occasion when the honourable aubrey pershaw fell in love with a young person at the gaiety theatre otherwise i could have told him he was not acting judicious his lordship opposed the match in every way and the young couple ran off and got married at the registrar's it was the same when a young man who was tutor to a ladyship's brother attracted lady evelyn walls the only daughter of the earl of ackleton in fact your lordship the only entanglement of the kind that came to a satisfactory conclusion in the whole of my personal experience was the affair of lady catherine dewsby lord bridgefield's daughter who injudiciously became infatuated with the roller-skating instructor lord belpher had ceased to feel distantly superior to his companion the butler's powerful personality hypnotized him long ere the harangue was ended he was as a little child drinking in the utterances of a master he bent forward eagerly keggs had broken off his remarks at the most interesting point what happened inquired percy the young man proceeded keggs was a young man of considerable personal attractions having large brown eyes and an athletic lissome figure brought about by roller-skating it was no wonder in the opinion of the servants all that her ladyship should have found herself fascinated by him particularly as i myself had heard her observe at a full luncheon table that roller-skating was in her opinion the only thing except her toy pomeranian that made life worth living but when she announced that she had become engaged to this young man there was the greatest consternation i was not of course privileged to be a participant at any of the councils and discussions that ensued and took place but i was aware that such transpired with great frequency eventually his lordship took the shrewd step of assuming acquiescence and inviting the young man to visit us in scotland and within ten days of his arrival your lordship the match was broken off he went back to his roller-skating and a ladyship took up visiting the poor and eventually contracted an altogether suitable alliance by marrying lord ronald spoforth the second son of his grace the duke of gorbals at strothbungo how did it happen seeing the young man in the surroundings of her own home her ladyship soon began to see that she had taken too romantic a view of him previous your lordship he was one of the lower middle class what is sometimes termed the bourgeoisie and his habits were not the habits of the class to which her ladyship belonged he had nothing in common with the rest of the house party and was injudicious in his choice of forks the very first night at dinner he took a steel knife to the entree and i see her ladyship look at him very sharp as much to say that scales had fallen from her eyes it didn't take her long after that to become convinced that her aunt had led her astray then you think it is not for me to presume to offer anything but the most respectful advice to your lordship but i should most certainly advocate a similar procedure in the present instance lord belpher reflected recent events had brought home to him the magnitude of the task he had assumed when he had appointed himself the watcher of his sister's movements the affair of the curate and the village blacksmith had shaken him both physically and spiritually his feet were still sore and his confidence in himself had waned considerably the thought of having to continue his espionage indefinitely was not a pleasant one how much simpler and more effective it would be to adopt a suggestion which had been offered to him i'm not sure you aren't right keggs thank you your lordship i feel convinced of it i will speak to my father to-night very good your lordship i'm glad to have been of service young blighted albert said keggs crisply shortly after breakfast on the following morning you are to take this note to mr bevan at the cottage down by platt's farm and you are to deliver it without playing any of your monkey tricks and you are to wait for an answer and you are to bring that answer back to me too and to lord marshmoreton and i may tell you to save you the trouble of opening it with steam from the kitchen kettle that i have already done so it's an invitation to dine with us to-night so now you know look slippy 
Albert capitulated. For the first time in his life he felt humble. He perceived how misguided he had been ever to suppose that he could pit his pygmy wits against this smooth-faced worker of wonders. Crikey! he ejaculated. It was all he could say. And there's one more thing, young fellow, me lad, added Keggs earnestly. Don't you ever grow up to be such a fat-head as our friend Percy. Don't you forget I warned you. End of chapter 22「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Damsel in Distress by P. G. Woodhouse Read by Yaspistachio in Waxaw, North Carolina. Chapter 23 Life is like some crazy machine that is always going either too slow or too fast. From the cradle to the grave we alternate between the Sargasso Sea and the rapids, forever either becalmed or storm-tossed. It seemed to Maud, as she looked across the dinner-table in order to make sure for the twentieth time that it really was George Bevan who sat opposite to her, that, after months in which nothing ever had happened, she was now living through a period when everything was happening at once. Life, from being a broken-down machine, had suddenly begun to race. To the orderly routine that had stretched back to the time when she had been hurried home in disgrace from Wales, there had succeeded a mad whirl of events, to which the miracle of to-night had come as a fitting climax. She had not begun to dress for dinner until somewhat late, and had consequently entered the drawing-room, just as Keggs was announcing that the meal was ready. She had received her first shock when the lovesick plumber, emerging from a mixed crowd of relatives and friends, had informed her that he was to take her in. She had not expected plumber to be there, though he lived in the neighbourhood. Plummer, at their last meeting, had stated his intention of going abroad for a bit, to mend his bruised heart, and it was a little disconcerting to a sensitive girl to find her victim popping up again like this. She did not know that, as far as Plummer was concerned, the whole affair was to be considered opened again. To Plummer, analyzing the girl's motives in refusing him, there had come the idea that there was another, and that this other might be Reggie Bing. From the first he had always looked upon Reggie as his worst rival. And now Reggie had bolted with the Faraday girl, leaving Maud in excellent condition, so it seemed to Plummer, to console herself with a worthier man. Plummer knew all about the rebound, and the part it plays in the affairs of the heart. His own breach of promise case, two years earlier, had been entirely due to the fact that the refusal of the youngest Devonish girl to marry him had caused him to rebound into the dangerous society of the second girl from the O.P., end of the first row in "'Summertime is Kissing Time' number, in the Alhambra Review. He had come to the castle to-night gloomy, but not without hope. Maud's second shock eclipsed the first entirely. No notification had been given to her, either by her father or by Percy, of the proposed extension of the hand of hospitality to George, and the sight of him standing there talking to her Aunt Caroline made her momentarily dizzy. Life, which for several days had had all the properties now of a dream, now of a nightmare, became more unreal than ever. She could conceive of no explanation of George's presence. He could not be there. That was all there was to it. Yet there undoubtedly he was. Her manner, as she accompanied Plummer down the stairs, took on such a dazed sweetness that her escort felt that in coming there that night he had done the wisest act of a lifetime, studded but sparsely with wise acts. It seemed to Plummer that this girl had softened towards him. Certainly something had changed her. He could not know that she was merely wondering if she was awake. George, meanwhile, across the table, was also having a little difficulty in adjusting his faculties to the progress of events. He had given up trying to imagine why he had been invited to this dinner, and was now endeavouring to find some theory which would square with the fact of Billy Dore being at the castle. At precisely this hour, Billy, by rights, should have been putting the finishing touches on her make-up in a second-floor dressing-room at the Regal. 
Yet there she sat, very much at her ease, in this aristocratic company, so quietly and unobtrusively dressed in some black stuff that at first he had scarcely recognized her. She was talking to the bishop. The voice of Keggs at his elbow broke in on his reverie. "'Sherry or ox, sir?' George could not have explained why this reminder of the butler's presence should have made him feel better, but it did. There was something solid and tranquilizing about Keggs. He had noticed it before. For the first time the sensation of having been smitten over the head with some blunt instrument began to abate. It was as if Keggs, by the mere intonation of his voice, had said, "'All this, no doubt, seems very strange and unusual to you. But feel no alarm. I am here.' George began to sit up and take notice. A cloud seemed to have cleared from his brain. He found himself looking on his fellow diners as individuals rather than as a confused mass. The prophet Daniel, after the initial embarrassment of finding himself in the society of the lions had passed away, must have experienced a somewhat similar sensation. He began to sort these people out and label them. There had been introductions in the drawing-room but they had left him with a bewildered sense of having heard somebody recite a page from Burke's Peerage. Not since that day in the free library in London, when he had dived into that fascinating volume in order to discover Maud's identity, had he undergone such a reign of titles. He now took stock, to ascertain how many of these people he could identify. The stock-taking was an absolute failure— of all those present, the only individuals he could swear to were his own personal little playmates, with whom he had sported in other surroundings. There was Lord Belfer, for instance, eyeing him with a hostility that could hardly be called veiled. There was Lord Marshmorton, at the head of the table, listening glumly to the conversation of a stout woman with a pearl necklace. But who was that woman? Was it Lady Jane Allenby, or Lady Edith Wade Beverley? or Lady Patricia Fowles? And who, above all, was the pie-faced fellow with the moustache talking to Maud? He sought assistance from the girl he had taken in to dinner. She appeared, as far as he could ascertain from a short acquaintance, to be an amiable little thing. She was small and young and fluffy, and he had caught enough of her name at the moment of introduction to gather that she was plain Miss Something a fact which seemed to him to draw them together. "'I wish you would tell me who some of these people are,' he said, as he turned from talking to the man on her other side. "'Who is that man over there?' "'Which man?' "'The one talking to Lady Maud, the fellow whose face ought to be shuffled and dealt again.' "'That's my brother.' That held George during the soup. "'I'm sorry about your brother.' he said, rallying with the fish. "'That's very sweet of you. "'It was the light that deceived me. "'Now that I look again, I see that his face has great charm.' The girl giggled. George began to feel better. "'Who are some of the others? "'I didn't get your name, for instance. "'They shot it at me so quick that it had whizzed by before I could catch it. Oh, "'My name is Plummer.' George was electrified. He looked across the table with more vivid interest. The amorous plumber had been just a voice to him till now. It was exciting to see him in the flesh. "'And who are the rest of them?' Oh, "'They are all members of the family. I thought you knew them.' "'I know Lord Marshmorton, and Lady Maud, and, of course, Lord Belfer.' He caught Percy's eye as it surveyed him coldly from the other side of the table, and nodded cheerfully. "'Great pal of mine, Lord Belfer.' The fluffy Miss Plummer twisted her pretty face into a grimace of disapproval. "'I don't like Percy.' "'No?' "'I think he's conceited.' "'Surely not. What could he have to be conceited about?' "'He's stiff.' "'Yes, of course. That's how he strikes people at first. The first time I met him I thought he was an awful stiff. But you should see him in his moments of relaxation. He's one of those fellows you have to get to know.' He grows on you. Yes, but look at that affair with the policeman in London. Everybody in the country is talking about it. Young blood, sighed George. Young blood, of course, Percy is wild. He must have been intoxicated. Oh, undoubtedly, said George. 
Miss Plummer glanced across the table. "'Do look at Edwin.' "'Which is Edwin?' "'My brother, I mean. Look at the way he keeps staring at Maud. Edwin's awfully in love with Maud. She rattled on with engaging frankness. "'At least he thinks he is. He's been in love with a different girl every season since I came out. And now that Reggie Bing has gone and married Alice Faraday, he thinks he has a chance. You heard about that, I suppose?' "'Yes, I did hear something about it.' "'Of course. Edwin's wasting his time, really. I happen to know,' Miss Plummer sank her voice to a whisper, "'I happen to know that Maud's awfully in love with some man she met in Wales last year, but the family won't hear of it.' "'Families are like that,' agreed George. "'Nobody knows who he is, but everybody in the country knows all about it. Those things get about, you know. Of course, it's out of the question. Maud will have to marry somebody awfully rich, or with a title. Her family's one of the oldest in England, you know. So I understand. It isn't as if she were in the daughter of Lord Peebles, somebody like that. Why Lord Peebles? Well, what I mean to say is, said Miss Plummer, with a silvery echo of Reggie Bing, he made his money in whiskey. That's better than spending it that way, argued George. Miss Plummer looked puzzled. "'I see what you mean,' she said a little vaguely. "'Lord Marshmorton is so different.' "'Haughty nobleman stuff, eh?' "'Yes.' "'So you think this mysterious man in Wales hasn't a chance?' "'Not unless he and Maud elope like Reggie Bing and Alice. Wasn't that exciting? Who would ever have expected Reggie had the dash to do a thing like that? Lord Marshmorton's new secretary is very pretty, don't you think?' "'Which is she? The girl in black with the golden hair?' "'Is she Lord Marshmorton's secretary?' "'Yes. She's an American girl. I think she's much nicer than Alice Faraday. I was talking to her before dinner. Her name is Dor. Her father was a captain in the American army, who died without leaving her a penny. He was the youngest son of a very distinguished family, but his family disowned him because he married against their wishes.' "'Something ought to be done to stop these families,' said George. "'They're always up to something.' "'So Miss Dorr had to go out and earn her own living. "'It must have been awful for her, mustn't it, having to give up society?' "'Did she give up society?' "'Oh, yes. "'She used to go everywhere in New York before her father died. "'I think American girls are wonderful. "'They have so much enterprise.' "'George at the moment was thinking that it was in imagination that they excelled.' "'I wish I could go out and earn my living,' said Miss Plummer. "'But the family won't dream of it.' "'The family again,' said George sympathetically. "'They're a perfect curse.' "'I want to go on the stage. Are you fond of the theatre? "'Fairly.' "'I love it. Have you seen Hubert Broadley in "'Twas Once Spring?' "'I'm afraid I haven't. He's wonderful. Have you seen Cynthia Dane in a woman's no? I missed that one, too. Hmm. Perhaps you prefer musical pieces? I saw an awfully good musical comedy before I left town. It's called Follow the Girl. It's at the Regal Theatre. Have you seen it? I wrote it. You what? That is to say, I wrote the music. Oh, but the music's lovely, gasped little Miss Plummer, as if the fact made his claim ridiculous. "'I've been humming it ever since.' "'I can't help that. I still stick to it that I wrote it.' "'You aren't George Bevan.' "'I am.' "'But—' Miss Plummer's voice almost failed here. "'But I've been dancing to your music for years. I've got about fifty of your records on the Victrola at home.' George blushed. However successful a man may be, he can never get used to fame at close range." "'Why, that tricky thing, you know, in the second act, is the darlingest thing I ever heard. I'm mad about it. "'Do you mean the one that goes lumpty lumpty tum tumpty tumpty tum "'No, the one that goes tarumpty tumpty tum tarumpty tum "'You know, the one about the granny dancing the shimmy.' "'I'm not responsible for the words, you know,' urged George hastily. "'Those are wished on me by the lyrist. "'I think the words are splendid.' "'although poor Popper thinks it's improper. "'Granny's always doing it, and nobody can stop her. "'I loved it.'
Miss Plummer leaned forward excitedly. She was an impulsive girl. "'Lady Caroline!' Conversation stopped. Lady Caroline turned. "'Yes, Millie?' "'Did you know that Mr. Bevan was THE Mr. Bevan?' Everybody was listening now. George huddled pinkly in his chair. He had not foreseen this ballyhooing. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego combined had never felt a tithe of the warmth that consumed him. He was essentially a modest young man. "'The Mr. Bevan,' echoed Lady Caroline coldly. It was painful to her to have to recognize George's existence on the same planet as herself. To admire him, as Miss Plummer apparently expected her to do, was a loathsome task. She cast one glance, fresh from the refrigerator, at the shrinking George, and elevated her aristocratic eyebrows. Miss Plummer was not dampened. She was at the hero-worshipping age, and George shared with the Messrs, Fairbanks, Francis X, Bushman, and one or two tennis champions an imposing pedestal in her hall of fame. "'You know George Bevan, who wrote the music of Follow the Girl.' Lady Caroline showed no signs of thawing. She had not heard of Follow the Girl. Her attitude suggested that, while she admitted the possibility of George having disgraced himself in the manner indicated, it was nothing to her. "'And all those other things,' pursued Mrs. Plummer, infatigably. "'You must have heard his music on the Victrola.' "'Why, of course!' It was not Lady Caroline who spoke, but a man further down the table. He spoke with enthusiasm. "'Of course, by Jove!' he said. "'The Schenectady shimmy, by Jove, and all that ripping!' Everybody seemed pleased and interested. Everybody, that is to say, except Lady Caroline and Lord Belpher. Percy was feeling that he had been tricked. He cursed the imbecility of Keggs in suggesting that this man should be invited to dinner. Everything had gone wrong. George was an undoubted success. The majority of the company were solid for him. As far as exposing his unworthiness in the eyes of Maud was concerned, the dinner had been a ghastly failure. Much better to have left him to lurk in his infernal cottage. Lord Belpher drained his glass moodily. He was seriously upset. But his discomfort at the moment was as nothing to the agony which rent his tortured soul a moment later— Lord Marshmorton, who had been listening with growing excitement to the chorus of approval, rose from his seat. He cleared his throat. It was plain that the Lord Marshmorton had something on his mind. <clears throat> er, he said. The clatter of conversation ceased once more, stunned, as it always is at dinner parties when one of the gathering is seen to have assumed an upright position. Lord Marshmorton cleared his throat again. His tanned face had taken on a deeper hue, and there was a look in his eyes which seemed to suggest that he was defying something or somebody. It was the look which Ajax had in his eyes when he defied the lightning, the look which nervous husbands have when they announce their intention of going round the corner to bowl a few games with the boys. One could not say definitely that Lord Marshmorton looked pop-eyed. On the other hand, one could not assert truthfully that he did not. At any rate, he was manifestly embarrassed. He had made up his mind to a certain course of action on the spur of the moment, taking advantage, as others have done, of the trend of popular enthusiasm, and his state of mind was nervous, but resolute, like that of a soldier going over the top. He cleared his throat for the third time, took one swift glance at his sister Caroline, then gazed glassily into the emptiness above her head. "'Take this opportunity,' he said rapidly, clutching at the tablecloth for support. "'Take this opportunity of announcing the engagement of my daughter Maud to Mr. Bevan. "'And,' he concluded with a rush, pouring back into his chair, "'I should like you all to drink their health.' There was a silence that hurt. It was broken by two sounds, occurring simultaneously in different parts of the room. One was a gasp from Lady Caroline. The other— was a crash of glass. For the first time in a long, unblemished career, Keggs, the butler, had dropped a tray. End of chapter 23
LibriVox.org. A Damsel in Distress by P. G. Wodehouse, as read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk. Chapter Twenty Four. Out on the terrace, the night was very still. From a steel blue sky, the stars looked down as calmly as they had looked on the night of the ball, when George had waited by the shrubbery, listening to the wailing of the music, and thinking long thoughts. From the dark meadows by the brook came the cry of a corncrake, its harsh note softened by distance. "'What shall we do?' said Maud. She was sitting on the stone seat where Reggie Bing had sat, and meditated on his love for Alice Faraday, and his unfortunate habit of slicing his approach shots. To George, as he stood beside her, she was a white blur in the darkness. He could not see her face. "'I don't know,' he said, frankly. Nor did he. Like Lady Caroline and Lord Belpher and Keggs the butler, he had been completely overwhelmed by Lord Marshmoreton's dramatic announcement. The situation had come upon him unheralded by any warning, and had found him unequal to it. A choking sound suddenly proceeded from the whiteness that was Maud. In the stillness it sounded like some loud noise— it jarred on George's disturbed nerves. Please! I can't help it! There's nothing to cry about, really. If we think long enough, we shall find some way out, all right. Please don't cry. I'm not crying! The choking sound became an unmistakable ripple of mirth. It's so absurd! Poor father getting up like that in front of everyone! Did you see Aunt Caroline's face? It haunts me still, said George. I shall never forget it. Your brother didn't seem any too pleased, either. Maud stopped laughing. It's an awful position, she said soberly. The announcement will be in the morning post the day after tomorrow, and then the letters of congratulation will begin to pour in, and after that the presents. And I simply can't see how we can convince them all that there has been a mistake. Another aspect of the matter struck her. It's so hard on you, too. Oh, don't think about me, urged George. Heaven knows I'd give the whole world if we could just let the thing go on. "'But there's no use in discussing impossibilities.' "'He lowered his voice. "'There's no use either in my pretending "'that I'm not going to have a pretty bad time. "'But we won't discuss that. "'It was my own fault. "'I came butting into your life of my own free will. "'And whatever happens, "'it's been worth it to have known you "'and tried to be of service to you. "'You're the best friend I ever had. "'I'm glad you think that. "'The best and kindest friend any girl ever had. "'I wish—' "'She broke off. "'Oh, well—' There was a silence. In the castle, somebody had begun to play the piano. Then a man's voice began to sing. "'That's Edwin Plummer,' said Maud. "'How badly he sings!' George laughed. Somehow the intrusion of Plummer had removed the tension. Plummer, whether designedly and as a sombre commentary on the situation, or because he was the sort of man who does sing that particular song, was chanting Tosti's Goodbye. He was giving to its never very cheery notes a wailing melancholy all his own. A dog in the stables began to howl in sympathy, and with the sound came curious soothing of George's nerves. He might feel broken-hearted later, but for the moment, with this double accompaniment, it was impossible for a man with humour in his soul to dwell on the deeper emotions. Plummer and his canine duettist had brought him to earth. He felt calm and practical. "'We better talk the whole thing over quietly,' he said. "'There's certain to be some solution. "'At the worst, you can always go to Lord Marshmoreton "'and tell him that he spoke without a sufficient grasp of his subject.' "'I could,' said Maud. "'But just at present, I feel as if I'd rather do anything else in the world. "'You don't realise what it must have cost Father "'to defy Aunt Caroline openly like that. "'Ever since I was old enough to notice anything, "'I have seen how she dominated him.' It was Aunt Caroline who really caused all this trouble. If it had only been father, I could have coaxed him to let me marry any one I pleased. I wish, if you possibly can, you would think of some other solution. I haven't had an opportunity of telling you, said George, that I called at Belgrave Square, as you asked me to do. I went there directly I had seen Reggie Bing safely married. Did you see him married? I was best man. Dear old Reggie, I hope you will be happy. He will. Don't worry about that. Well, as I was saying, I called at Belgrave Square and found the house shut up. I couldn't get any answer to the bell, though I kept my thumb on it for minutes at the time. I think they must have gone abroad again. No, it wasn't that. I had a letter from Geoffrey this morning. His uncle died of apoplexy while they were in Manchester on a business trip. She paused. He left Geoffrey all his money, she went on. Every penny. 
The silence seemed to stretch out interminably. The music from the castle had ceased. The quiet of the summer night was unbroken. To George, the stillness had a touch of the sinister. It was the ghastly silence of the end of the world. With a shock, he realized that, even now, he had been permitting himself to hope, futile as he recognized the hope to be. Maud had told him she loved another man. That should have been final. And yet, somehow, his indomitable subconscious self had refused to accept it as final. But this news ended everything. The only obstacle that had held Maud and this man apart was removed. There was nothing to prevent them marrying. George was conscious of a vast depression. The last strand of the rope had parted, and he was drifting, alone, out into the ocean of desolation. "'Oh,' he said, and was surprised that his voice sounded very much the same as usual. Speech was so difficult that it seemed strange that it should show no signs of effort. "'That alters everything, doesn't it?' "'He said in his letter that he wanted me to meet him in London, and talk things over, I suppose.' "'Well, there's nothing now to prevent your going. I mean, now that your father has made this announcement, you are free to go where you please.' "'Yes, I suppose I am.' There was another silence. "'Everything's so difficult,' said Maud. "'In what way? Oh, I don't know.' "'If you are thinking of me,' said George, "'please don't. I know exactly what you mean. You are hating the thought of hurting my feelings. I wish you would look on me as having no feelings. All I want is to see you happy.' And as I said just now, it's enough for me to know that I've helped you. Do be reasonable about it. The fact that our engagement has been officially announced makes no difference in our relations to each other. As far as we two are concerned, we are exactly where we were the last time we met. It's no worse for me now than it was then to know that I'm not the man you love, and that there's somebody else you loved before you ever knew of my existence. For goodness sake, a girl like you must be used to having men tell her that they love her and having to tell them that she can't love them in return. "'But you're so different. Not a bit of it. I'm just one of the crowd. "'I've never known anybody quite like you. "'Well, you've never known anybody quite like Plummer, I should imagine, "'but the thought of his sufferings didn't break your heart. "'I've known a million men exactly like Edwin Plummer,' said Maud emphatically. "'All the men I ever have known have been like him, quite nice and pleasant and negative. "'It never seemed to matter of refusing them. "'One knew that they would be just a little bit piqued for a week or two, "'and then wander off and fall in love with somebody else. "'But you're different.' you matter that is where we disagree my argument is that where your happiness is concerned i don't matter maud rested her chin on her hand and stared out into the velvet darkness you ought to have been my brother instead of percy she said at last what chums we should have been and how simple that would have made everything the best thing for you to do is to regard me as an honorary brother that will make everything simple it's easy to talk like that "'No, it isn't. It's horribly hard. I know exactly how difficult it is for you to talk as you have been doing, to try to make me feel better by pretending the whole trouble is just a trifle. It's strange. We have only met, really, for a few minutes at a time, and three weeks ago I didn't know there was such a person as you. But somehow I seem to know everything you're thinking. I've never felt like that before with any man, even Geoffrey. He always puzzled me.' She broke off. The corncrake began to call again out in the distance. "'I wish I knew what to do,' she said with a catch in her voice. "'I'll tell you in two words what to do. The whole thing is absurdly simple. You love this man, and he loves you, and all that kept you apart before was the fact that he could not afford to marry you. Now that he is rich, there is no obstacle at all. I simply won't let you look on me and my feelings as an obstacle. Rule me out altogether.' Your father's mistake has made the situation a little more complicated than it need have been, but that can easily be remedied. Imitate the excellent example of Reggie Bing. He was in a position where it would have been embarrassing to announce what he intended to do, so he very sensibly went quietly off and did it, and left everybody to find out after it was done. I'm bound to say I never looked on Reggie as a mastermind, but when it came to finding a way out of embarrassing situations, one has to admit he had the right idea. Do what he did. Maud started. She half rose from the stone seat. George could hear the quick intake of her breath. "'You mean, run away?' "'Exactly. Run away.' An automobile swung around the corner of the castle from the direction of the garage and drew up, purring at the steps. There was a flood of light and the sound of voices as the great door opened. Maud rose. "'People are leaving,' she said. "'I didn't know it was so late.' She stood irresolutely. "'I suppose I ought to go in and say good-bye.' but I don't think I can. Stay where you are. Nobody will see you. 
More automobiles arrived. The quiet of the night was shattered by the noise of their engines. Maud sat down again. I suppose they will think it very odd of me not being there. Never mind what people think. Reggie Bing didn't. Maud's foot traced circles on the dry turf. What a lovely night, she said. There's no dew at all. The automobiles snorted, tooted, backfired, and passed away. Their clamour died in the distance, leaving the night a thing of peace and magic once more. The door of the castle closed with a bang. I suppose I ought to be going in now, said Maud. I suppose so. And I ought to be there, too, politely making my farewells. But something seems to tell me that Lady Caroline and your brother will be quite ready to dispense with the formalities. I shall go home. They faced each other in the darkness. "'Would you really do that?' asked Maud. "'Run away, I mean, and get married in London. "'It's the only thing to do.' "'But can one get married as quickly as that?' "'At a registrar's? Nothing simpler. "'You should have seen Reggie Bing's wedding. "'It was over before one realised it had started. "'A snuffy little man in a black coat with a cold in his head "'asked a few questions, wrote a few words, and the thing was done. "'That sounds rather... dreadful. Well, "'Reggie didn't seem to think so. "'Unromantic, I mean.' prosaic you would supply the romance of course one ought to be sensible it is just the same as a regular wedding in effects absolutely they moved up the terrace together on the gravel drive by the steps they paused i'll do it said maud george had to make an effort before he could reply for all his sane and convincing arguments he could not check a pang at this definite acceptance of them he had begun to appreciate now the strain under which he had been speaking "'You must,' he said. "'Well, good-bye.' There was light on the drive. He could see her face. Her eyes were troubled. "'What will you do?' she asked. "'Do?' "'I mean, are you going to stay on in your cottage?' "'No, I hardly think I could do that. I shall go back to London to-morrow, and stay at the Carlton for a few days. Then I shall sail for America. There are a couple pieces I've got to do for the fall. I ought to be starting on them.' Maud looked away. "'You've got your work,' she said, almost inaudibly. George understood her. "'Yes, I've got my work.' "'I'm glad.' She held out her hand. "'You've been very wonderful. Right from the beginning. You've been—' "'Oh, what's the use of me saying anything? I've had my reward. I've known you. We're friends, aren't we?' "'My best friend. Pals? Pals.' They shook hands. End of chapter 24「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Damsel in Distress by P. G. Woodhouse. Read by Yaspistachio in Waxhaw, North Carolina. Chapter 25 "'I was never so upset in my life,' said Lady Caroline. She had been saying the same thing and many other things for the past five minutes. Until the departure of the last guest she had kept an icy command of herself, and shown an unruffled front to the world. She had even contrived to smile. But now, with the final automobile whirring homewards, she had thrown off the mask. The very furniture of Lord Marshmorton's study seemed to shrink, seared by the flame of her wrath. As for Lord Marshmorton himself, he looked quite shrivelled. It had not been an easy matter to bring her erring brother to bay. The hunt had been in progress full ten minutes before she and Lord Belpher finally cornered the poor wretch. His plea, through the keyhole of the locked door, that he was working on the family history and could not be disturbed, was ignored, and now he was face to face with the Avengers. "'I cannot understand it,' continued Lady Caroline. "'You know that for months we have all been straining every nerve to break off this horrible entanglement, and just as we had begun to hope that something might be done, you announced the engagement in the most public manner. I think you must be out of your mind. I can hardly believe even now that this appalling thing has happened. I am hoping that I shall wake up and find it as all a nightmare. How you can have done such a thing I cannot understand!' "'Quite,' said Lord Belpher. If Lady Caroline was upset, there are no words in the language that will adequately describe the emotions of Percy. 
from the very start of this lamentable episode in high life, Percy had been in the forefront of the battle. It was Percy who had had his best hat smitten from his head in the full view of all Piccadilly. It was Percy who had suffered arrest and imprisonment in the cause. It was Percy who had been crippled for days owing to his zeal in tracking Maud across the country, and now all his sufferings were in vain. He had been betrayed by his own father. There was, so the historians of the Middle West tell us, a man of Chicago named Young, who once, when his nerves were unstrung, put his mother, unseen, in the chopping machine, and canned her and labelled her tongue. It is enough to say that the glance of disapproval which Percy cast upon his father at this juncture would have been unduly severe if cast by the young offspring upon their parent at the moment of confession. Lord Marshmorton had rallied from his initial panic. The spirit of revolt began to burn again in his bosom. Once the die is cast for revolution, there can be no looking back. One must defy, not apologize. Perhaps the inherited tendencies of a line of ancestors who, whatever their shortcomings, had at least known how to treat their womenfolk, came to his aid. Possibly there stood by his side in this crisis ghosts of dead and buried Marshmortons, whispering spectral encouragement in his ear. The ghosts, let us suppose, of that earl who, in the days of the seventh Henry, had stabbed his wife with a dagger to cure her tendency to lecture him at night. Or of that other earl, who, at a previous date in the annals of the family, had caused two aunts and a sister to be poisoned, apparently from a mere whim. At any rate, Lord Marshmorton produced from some source sufficient courage to talk back. "'Silly nonsense,' he grunted. "'Don't see what you're making all this fuss about. Maud loves the fellow. I like the fellow. Perfectly decent fellow. Nothing to make a fuss about. Why shouldn't I announce the engagement?' "'You must be mad!' cried Lady Caroline. "'Your only daughter, and a man nobody knows anything about.' "'Quite,' said Percy. Lord Marshmorton seized his advantage with the skill of an adroit debater. "'That's where you're wrong. I know all about him. He is a very rich man. You heard the way all those people at dinner behaved when they heard his name. Very celebrated man. Makes thousands of pounds a year. Perfectly suitable match in every way.' "'It is not a suitable match,' said Lady Caroline vehemently. I don't care whether this Mr. Bevan makes thousands of pounds a year or twopence a penny. The match is not suitable. Money is not everything. She broke off. A knock had come on the door. The door opened, and Billy Dore came in. A kind-hearted girl. She had foreseen that Lord Marshmorton might be glad of a change of subject at about this time. "'Would you like me to help you tonight? she asked brightly. "'I thought I would ask if there was anything you wanted me to do.' Lady Caroline snatched hurriedly at her aristocratic calm. She resented the interruption acutely, but her manner, when she spoke, was bland. "'Lord Marshmorton will not require your help to-night,' she said. "'He will not be working.' "'Good night,' said Billy. "'Good night,' said Lady Caroline. Percy scowled a valediction. "'Money,' resumed Lady Caroline, "'is immaterial.' Maud is in no position to be obliged to marry a rich man. What makes the thing impossible is that Mr. Bevan is a nobody. He comes from nowhere. He has no social standing whatsoever. Don't see it, said Lord Marshmorton. The fellow's a thoroughly decent fellow. That's all that matters. How can you be so pig-headed? You are talking like an imbecile. Your secretary, Miss Dore, is a nice girl. "'But how would you feel if Percy were to come to you "'and say he was engaged to be married to her?' "'Exactly,' said Percy. "'Quite.' "'Lord Marshmorton rose and moved to the door. "'He did it with a certain dignity, "'but there was a strange, hunted expression in his eyes. "'That would be impossible,' he said. "'Precisely,' said his sister. "'I am glad that you admit it.' Lord Marshmorton had reached the door, and was standing holding the handle. He seemed to gather strength from its support. "'I've been meaning to tell you about that,' he said. "'About what?' "'About Miss Dore. I married her myself last Wednesday,' said Lord Marshmorton. 
and disappeared like a diving duck. End of chapter 25「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Damsel in Distress by P. G. Wodehouse. As read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk. Chapter 26 At a quarter past four in the afternoon, two days after the memorable dinner party at which Lord Marshmoreton had behaved with so notable a lack of judgment, Maud sat in Ye Cosy Nook, waiting for Geoffrey Raymond. He had said in his telegram that he would meet her there at four-thirty, but eagerness had brought Maud to the tryst a quarter of an hour ahead of time, and already the sadness of her surroundings was causing her to regret this impulsiveness. Depression had settled upon her spirit. She was aware of something that resembled foreboding. Ye Cosy Nook, as its name will immediately suggest to those who know their London, is a tea-shop in Bond Street, conducted by a distressed gentlewoman. In London, when a gentlewoman becomes distressed, which she seems to do on the slightest provocation, she collects about her two or three other distressed gentlewomen, forming a quorum, and starts a tea-shop in the West End, which she calls Ye Oak Leaf, Ye Old Willow Pattern, Ye Linden Tree, or Ye Snug Harbour, according to personal taste. There, dressed in Tyrolese, Japanese, Norwegian, or some other exotic costume, she and her associates administer refreshments of an afternoon with a proud languor calculated to knock the nonsense out of the cheeriest customer. Here you will find none of the coarse bustle and efficiency of the rival establishments of Lyon and Co., nor the glitter and gaiety of Rumpelmayer's. These places have an atmosphere of their own. They rely for their effect on an insufficiency of light, an almost total lack of ventilation, a property chocolate cake which you are not supposed to cut, and the sad aloofness of their ministering angels. It is to be doubted whether there is anything in the world more damping to the spirit than a London tea-shop of this kind, unless it be another London tea-shop of the same kind. Maud sat and waited. Somewhere out of sight a kettle bubbled in an undertone, like a whispering pessimist. Across the room, two distressed gentlewomen in fancy dress leaned against the wall. They, too, were whispering. Their expressions suggested that they looked on life as low, and wished they were well out of it, like the body upstairs. One assumed that there was a body upstairs. One cannot help it at these places. One's first thought, on entering, is that the lady assistant will approach one, and ask in a hushed voice, "'Tea or chocolate, and would you care to view the remains?' Maud looked at her watch. It was twenty past four. She could scarcely believe that she had only been there five minutes, but the ticking of the watch assured her that it had not stopped. Her depression deepened. Why had Geoffrey told her to meet him in a cavern of gloom like this, instead of at the Savoy? She would have enjoyed the Savoy. But here she seemed to have lost beyond recovery the first gay eagerness with which she had set out to meet the man she loved. Suddenly she began to feel frightened. Some evil spirit— possibly the kettle, seemed to whisper to her that she had been foolish in coming here, to cast doubts on what she had hitherto regarded as the one rock-solid fact in the world, her love for Geoffrey. Could she have changed since those days in Wales? Life had been so confusing of late. In the vividness of recent happenings those days in Wales seemed a long way off. She herself different from the girl of a year ago. She found herself thinking about George Bevan. It was a curious fact that, the moment she began to think of George Bevan, she felt better. It was as if she had lost her way in a wilderness and had met a friend. There was something so capable, so soothing about George, and how well he had behaved at that last interview. George seemed somehow to be a part of her life. She could not imagine life in which he had no share. And he was, at this moment, probably, packing to return to America, and she would never see him again. Something stabbed at her heart. It was as if she were realizing now, for the first time, that he was really going. She tried to rid herself of the ache at her heart by thinking of Wales. She closed her eyes, and found that that helped her to remember. With her eyes shut, she could bring it all back, that rainy day, the graceful, supple figure that had come to her out of the mist, those walks over the hills. If only Geoffrey would come! It was the sight of him that she needed. "'There you are!' Maud opened her eyes with a start. The voice had sounded like Geoffrey's, but it was a stranger who stood by the table, and not a particularly prepossessing stranger, 
In the dim light of Yukosi Nook, to which her opening eyes had not yet grown accustomed, all she could see of the man was that he was remarkably stout. She stiffened defensively. This was what a girl who sat about in tea-rooms alone had to expect. "'I hope I'm not late,' said the stranger, sitting down and breathing heavily. "'I thought a little exercise would do me good, so I walked.' Every nerve in Maud's body seemed to come to life simultaneously. She tingled from head to foot. "'It was Geoffrey. He was looking over his shoulder and endeavouring, by snapping his fingers, to attract the attention of the nearest distressed gentlewoman, and this gave Maud time to recover from the frightful shock she had received. Her dizziness left her, and, leaving, was succeeded by a panic dismay. This couldn't be Geoffrey. It was outrageous that it should be Geoffrey. And yet it undeniably was Geoffrey. For a year she had prayed that Geoffrey might be given back to her, and the gods had heard her prayer. They had given her back Geoffrey and with a careless generosity they had given her twice as much of him as she had expected. She had asked for the slim Apollo whom she had loved in Wales, and this colossal changeling had arrived in his stead. We all of us have our prejudices. Maud had a prejudice against fat men. It may have been the spectacle of her brother Percy, bulging more and more every year she had known him, that had caused this kink in her character. At any rate, it existed, and she gazed in sickened silence at Geoffrey. He had turned again now, and she was enabled to get a full and complete view of him. He was not merely stout. He was gross. The slim figure which had haunted her for a year had spread into a sea of waistcoat. The keen lines of his face had disappeared altogether. His cheeks were pink jellies. One of the distressed gentlewomen had approached with a slow disdain, and was standing by the table, brooding on the corpse upstairs. It seemed a shame to bother her. "'Tea or chocolate?' she inquired proudly. "'Tea, please,' said Maud, finding her voice. "'On tea,' sighed the mourner. "'Chocolate for me,' said Geoffrey briskly, with the air of one discoursing on a congenial topic. "'I'd like plenty of whipped cream, and please see that it's hot.' "'One chocolate.' Geoffrey pondered. This was no light matter that occupied him. "'And bring some fancy cakes. I like the ones with the icing on them. And some tea-cake and buttered toast. Please see that there's plenty of butter on it.' Maud shivered. This man before her was a man in whose lexicon there should have been no such word as butter, a man who should have called for the police had some enemy endeavoured to thrust butter upon him. Well, said Geoffrey, leaning forward as the haughty ministrant drifted away, you haven't changed a bit. To look at, I mean. No, said Maud. You're just the same. I think I, he squinted down at his waistcoat, have put on a little weight. I don't know if you notice it. Maud shivered again. He thought he had put on a little weight, and didn't know if she had noticed it? She was oppressed by the eternal melancholy miracle of the fat man who does not realize that he has become fat. "'It was living on the yacht that put me a little out of condition,' said Geoffrey. "'I was on the yacht nearly all the time since I saw you last. The old boy had a Japanese cook and lived pretty high. It was apoplexy that got him. We had a great time touring about. We were on the Mediterranean all last winter, mostly at Nice.' "'I should like to go to Nice.' said Maud, for something to say. She was feeling that it was not only externally that Geoffrey had changed. Or had he, in reality, always been like this, commonplace and prosaic, and was it merely in her imagination that he had been wonderful? "'If you ever go,' said Geoffrey earnestly, "'don't fail to lunch at the Hotel Côte d'Azur. They give you the most amazing selection of hors d'oeuvres you ever saw, crayfish as big as baby lobsters, and there's a fish... I've forgotten its name. It'll come back to me. That's just like the Florida Pompano. Be careful to have it broiled, not fried. Otherwise you lose the flavor. Tell the waiter you must have it broiled, with melted butter and a little parsley and some plain boiled potatoes. It's really astonishing. It's the best to stick to fish on the continent. People can say what they like, but I maintain that the French don't really understand steaks or any sort of red meat. The veal isn't bad, though. I prefer our way of serving it. Of course, what the French are real geniuses at is the omelette. I remember when we put in at Toulon for coal, I went ashore for a stroll and had the most delicious omelette with chicken livers beautifully cooked at a little small, unpretentious place near the harbour. I shall always remember it. The mourner returned, bearing a laden tray from which she removed the funeral baked meats and placed them limply on the table. Geoffrey shook his head, annoyed. I particularly asked for plenty of butter on my toast, he said. I hate butter toast if there isn't lots of butter. It isn't worth eating. Get me a couple of pats, will you, and I'll spread it myself. Do hurry, please, before the toast gets cold. It's no good if the toast gets cold. They don't understand tea as a meal at these places. 
he said to Maud as the mourner withdrew. "'You have to go to the country to appreciate the real thing. "'I remember we lay off Lyme Regis down Devonshire Way for a few days, "'and I went and had tea at a farmhouse there. "'It was quite amazing. "'Thick Devonshire cream and homemade jam and cakes of every kind. "'This sort of thing here is just a farce. "'I do wish that woman would make haste with that butter. "'It'll be too late in a minute.' "'Maud sipped her tea in silence. "'Her heart was like lead within her.' The recurrence of the butter theme as a sort of leet motif in her companion's conversation was fraying her nerves till she felt she could endure a little more. She cast her mind's eye back over the horrid months and had a horrid vision of Geoffrey steadily absorbing butter day after day, week after week, ever becoming more and more of a human keg. She shuddered. Indignation at the injustice of fate in causing her to give her heart to a man and then changing him into another and quite different man fought with a cold terror which grew as she realized more and more clearly the magnitude of the mistake she had made. She felt that she must escape. And yet, how could she escape? She had definitely pledged herself to this man. Ah! cried Geoffrey gaily as the pats of butter arrived. That's more like it. He began to smear the toast. Maud averted her eyes. She had told him that she loved him, that he was the whole world to her, that there never would be anyone else. He had come to claim her. How could she refuse him just because he was about thirty pounds overweight? Geoffrey finished his meal. He took out a cigarette. "'No smoking, please,' said the distressed gentlewoman. He put the cigarette back in his case. There was a new expression in his eyes now, a tender expression. For the first time since they had met, Maud seemed to catch a far-off glimpse of the man she had loved in Wales. Butter appeared to have softened Geoffrey. "'So you couldn't wait?' he said with pathos. Maud did not understand. "'I waited over a quarter of an hour. It was you who were late.' "'I don't mean that. I'm referring to your engagement. I saw the announcement in the morning post. Well, I hope you will let me offer you my best wishes. This Mr. George Bevan, whoever he is, is lucky.' Maud had opened her mouth to explain, to say that it was all a mistake. She closed it again without speaking. "'So you couldn't wait,' proceeded Geoffrey, with a gentle regret. "'Well, I suppose I ought not to blame you. You are at an age when it's easy to forget. I had no right to hope that you would be proof against a few months' separation. I expected too much.' "'But it is ironical, isn't it? "'There was I, thinking always of those days last summer "'when we were everything to each other. "'Well, you had forgotten me. "'Forgotten me!' sighed Geoffrey. "'He picked a fragment of cake absently off the tablecloth "'and inserted it into his mouth. "'The unfairness of the attack stung Maud into speech. "'She looked back over the months, "'thought of all she had suffered, and ached with self-pity. "'I hadn't!' she cried. "'You hadn't? "'But you let this other man, this George Bevan, make love to you.' "'I didn't. It was all a mistake.' "'A mistake?' "'Yes. It would take too long to explain, but—' She stopped. It had come to her, suddenly, in a flash of clear vision, that the mistake was one which she had no desire to correct. She felt like one who, lost in a jungle, comes out after long wandering into the open air. For days she had been thinking confusedly, unable to interpret her own emotions, and now everything had abruptly become clarified. It was as if the sight of Geoffrey had been the key to a cipher— she loved George Bevan, the man she had sent out of her life for ever. She knew it now, and the shock of realization made her feel faint and helpless. And, mingled with the shock of realization, there came to her the mortification of knowing that her aunt, Lady Caroline, and her brother, Percy, had been right after all. What she had mistaken for the love of a lifetime had been, as they had so often insisted, a mere infatuation, unable to survive the spectacle of a Geoffrey who had been eating too much butter and put on flesh. Geoffrey swallowed his piece of cake and bent forward. "'Aren't you engaged to this man, Bevan?' Maud avoided his eye. She was aware that the crisis had arrived, and that her whole future hung on her next words. And then fate came to her rescue. Before she could speak, there was an interruption. "'Pardon me,' said a voice. "'One moment.' So intent had Maud and her companion been on their own affairs that neither of them observed the entrance of a third party— this was a young man, with mouse-coloured hair and a freckled, badly-shaven face, which seemed undecided whether to be furtive or impudent. He had small eyes, and his costume was a blend of the flashy and the shabby. He wore a bowler hat, tilted a little rakishly to one side, and carried a small bag, which he rested on the table, between them. "'Sorry to intrude, miss,' he bowed gallantly to Maud, "'but I want to have a few words with Mr. Spencer Gray here.' Maud, looking across at Geoffrey, was surprised to see that his florid face had lost much of its colour. His mouth was open, and his eyes had taken a glassy expression. "'I think you've made a mistake,' she said coolly. She disliked the young man at sight. 
this is mr raymond geoffrey found speech of course i'm mr raymond he cried angrily what do you mean by coming and annoying us like this the young man was not discomposed he appeared to be used to being unpopular he proceeded as though there had been no interruption he produced a dingy card glance at that he said messieurs willoughby and son solicitors i'm son the governor put this little matter in my hands i've been looking for you for days mr gray to hand you this paper he opened the bag like a conjurer performing a trick and brought out a stiff document of legal aspect you're a witness miss that i've served the papers you know what this is of course he said to geoffrey action for breach of promise of marriage our client miss yvonne sinclair of the regal theatre is suing you for ten thousand pounds and if you ask me said the young man with genial candour dropping the professional manner i don't mind telling you i think it's a walk-over it's the best little action for breach we've handled for years he became professional again your lawyers will no doubt communicate with us in due course and if you take my advice he concluded with another of his swift changes of manner you'll get him to settle out of court for between me and you and the lamp-post you haven't an earthly geoffrey had started to his feet he was puffing with outraged innocence what the devil do you mean by this he demanded can't you see you've made a mistake my name is not gray this lady has told you that i'm geoffrey raymond makes it all worse for you said the young man imperturbably making advances to our client under an assumed name we've got letters and witnesses and a whole bag of tricks and how about this photo he dived into his bag again do you recognize that miss maud looked at the photograph it was unmistakably geoffrey and it had evidently been taken recently for it showed the latter geoffrey the man of substance it was a full-length photograph and across the stout legs was written in a flowing hand the legend two babe from her little poodles maud gave a shudder and handed it back to the young man just as geoffrey reaching across the table made a grab for it i recognize it she said mr willoughby jr packed the photograph away in his bag and turned to go that's all for to-day then i think he said affably he bowed again in his courtly way tilted the hat a little more to the left and having greeted one of the distressed gentlewomen who loitered limply in his path with a polite if you please mabel which drew upon him a freezing stare of which he seemed oblivious he passed out leaving behind him strained silence maud was the first to break it i think i'll be going she said the words seemed to rouse her companion from his stupor let me explain there's nothing to explain it was just a it was just a passing it was nothing nothing poodles murmured maud geoffrey followed her as she moved to the door be reasonable pleaded geoffrey men aren't saints it was nothing are you going to end everything just because i lost my head maud looked at him with a smile she was conscious of an overwhelming relief the dim interior of ye cosy nook no longer seemed depressing she could have kissed this unknown babe whose business-like action had enabled her to close a regrettable chapter in her life with a clear conscience but you haven't only lost your head geoffrey she said you've lost your figure as well she went out quickly with a convulsive bound geoffrey started to follow her but was checked before he had gone a yard there are formalities to be observed before a patron can leave ye cosy nook if you please said a distressed gentlewomanly voice the lady whom mr willoughby had addressed as mabel erroneously for her name was ernestine was standing beside him with a slip of paper six and twopence said ernestine for a moment this appalling statement drew the unhappy man's mind from the main issue six and twopence for a cup of chocolate and a few cakes he cried aghast it's robbery six and twopence please said the queen of the bandits with undisturbed calm she had been through this sort of thing before ye cosy nook did not get many customers but it made the most of those it did get here geoffrey produced a half-sovereign i haven't time to argue the distressed brigand showed no gratification she had the air of one who is aloof from worldly things all she wanted was rest and leisure leisure to meditate upon the body upstairs all flesh is as grass we are here to-day and gone to-morrow but there beyond the grave is peace you'll change she said damn the change you are forgetting your hat damn my hat geoffrey dashed from the room he heaved his body through the door he lumbered down the stairs out in bond street the traffic moved up and the traffic moved down strollers strolled upon the sidewalks but maud had gone end of chapter twenty six This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Damsel in Distress by P. G. Woodhouse. Read by Yas Pistachio in Waxhaw, North Carolina. Chapter 27 In his bedroom at the Carlton Hotel, George Bevan was packing. That is to say, he had begun packing, but for the last twenty minutes he had been sitting on the side of the bed, staring into a future which became bleaker and bleaker the more he examined it. In the last two days he had been no stranger to these grey moods, and they had become harder and harder to dispel, now with a steamer-trunk before him, gaping to receive its contents, he gave himself up wholeheartedly to gloom. Somehow the steamer-trunk, with all that it implied of partings and voyagings, seemed to emphasize the fact that he was going out alone, into an empty world. Soon he would be on board the liner, every revolution of whose engines would be taking him farther away from where his heart would always be. There were moments when the torment of this realization became almost physical. It was incredible that three short weeks ago he had been a happy man, lonely, perhaps, but only in a vague, impersonal way, not lonely with this aching loneliness that tortured him now. What was there left for him? As regards any triumphs which the future might bring in connection with his work, he was, as Mac the stage-doorkeeper had said, blarzy. Any success he might have would be but a stale repetition of other successes which he had achieved. He would go on working, of course, but— The ringing of the telephone bell across the room jerked him back to the present. He got up with a muttered malediction. Somebody calling up again from the theatre, probably. They had been doing it all the time since he had announced his intention of leaving for America by Saturday's boat. "'Hello?' he said wearily. "'Is that George?' asked a voice. It seemed familiar, but all female voices sound the same over the telephone. "'This is George,' he replied. "'Who are you?' "'Don't you know my voice?' "'I do not. You'll know it quite well before long. I'm a great talker. Is that Billy?' "'It is not Billy, whoever Billy may be. I am female, George.' "'So is Billy.' "'Well, you had better run through the list of your feminine friends till you reach me.' "'I haven't any feminine friends.' "'None. That's odd. Why? "'You told me in the garden two nights ago that you looked on me as a pal.' George sat down abruptly. He felt boneless. "'Is—is that you?' he stammered. "'It can't be. Maud. "'How clever of you to guess, George. "'I want to ask you one or two things.' "'In the first place, are you fond of butter?' George blinked. This was not a dream. He had just bumped his knee against the corner of the telephone table, and it still hurt most convincingly. He needed the evidence to assure himself that he was awake. "'Butter?' he queried. "'What do you mean?' "'Oh, well, if you don't even know what butter means, I expect it's all right. What is your weight, George?' "'About a hundred and eighty pounds.' "'But I don't understand. "'Wait a minute.' "'There was a silence on the other end of the wire. "'About thirteen stone,' said Maud's voice. "'I've been doing it in my head. "'And what was it this time last year?' "'About the same, I think. "'I always weigh about the same. "'How wonderful, George!' "'Yes?' "'This is very important. "'Have you ever been in Florida?' "'I was there one winter.' "'Do you know a fish called the Pompano?' "'Yes. Tell me about it.' "'How do you mean? It's just a fish. You eat it.' "'I know. Go into details.' "'There aren't any details. You just eat it.' The voice at the other end of the wire purred with approval. "'I never heard anything so splendid. The last man who mentioned Pompano to me became absolutely lyrical about sprigs of parsley and melted butter. Well—' "'That's that. Now, here's another very important point. How about wallpaper?' George pressed his unoccupied hand against his forehead. This conversation was unnerving him. "'I didn't get that,' he said. "'Didn't get what?' 
I mean, I didn't quite catch what you said that time. It sounded to me like, what about wallpaper? It was what about wallpaper. Why not? But, said George weakly, it doesn't make any sense. Oh, but it does. I mean, what about wallpaper for your den? My den? Your den. You must have a den. Where do you suppose you're going to work, if you don't? Now, my idea would be some nice, quiet grass cloth, and, of course, you would have lots of pictures and books, and a photograph of me. I'll go and be taken specially. Then there would be a piano for you to work on, and two or three really comfortable chairs. And, well, that would be about all, wouldn't it? George pulled himself together. Hello? he said. Why do you say hello? I forgot I was in London. I should have said, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Well, then, what does it all mean? What does what mean? What you've been saying about butter and pompanos and wallpaper and my den and all that. I don't understand. How stupid of you. I was asking you what sort of wallpaper you would like in your den after we were married and settled down. George dropped the receiver. It clashed against the side of the table. He groped for it blindly. Hello? he said. Don't say hello. It sounds so abrupt. What did you say, then? I said don't say hello. No, no, before that, before that. You said something about getting married? Well, aren't we going to get married? Our engagement is announced in the morning post. But, but, George, Maud's voice shook. Don't tell me you are going to jilt me, she said tragically, because if you are, let me know in time, as I shall want to bring an action for breach of promise. I've just met to such a capable young man who will look after the whole thing for me. He wears a bowler hat on the side of his head and calls waitresses Mabel. Answer yes or no. Will you marry me? But, but how about, I mean, what about, I mean, how about... "'Make up your mind what you do mean.' "'The other fellow,' gasped George. "'A musical laugh was wafted to him over the wire. "'What about him?' "'Well, what about him?' said George. "'Isn't a gal allowed to change her mind?' said Maud. "'George yelped excitedly. "'Maud gave a cry. "'Don't sing,' she said. "'You nearly made me deaf.' "'Have you changed your mind?' "'Certainly I have.' "'And you really think, you really want, I mean, you really want, you really think? "'Don't be so incoherent. "'Maud, well, will you marry me? "'Of course I will. "'Gosh, what did you say? "'I said gosh. "'And listen to me, when I say gosh, I mean gosh. "'Where are you? I must see you. "'Where can we meet? I, I want to see you. "'For heaven's sake, tell me where you are. "'I want to see you. "'Where are you? Where are you?' I'm downstairs. Where? Here at the Carlton? Here at the Carlton. Alone? Quite alone. You won't be long, said George. He hung up the receiver and bounded across the room to where his coat hung over the back of a chair. The edge of the steamer trunk caught his shin. Well, said George to the steamer trunk, and what are you butting in for? Who wants you, I should like to know? End of chapter 27 End of A Damsel in Distress by P. G. Woodhouse Thank you for listening.